it's going to have to give me a break at some point. Surely that must be, that must count for something somewhere in my life. You're weighing up this, this survival of what can I do? How am I going to get through this? If someone's got a problem, they've got a problem. Let's just deal with it and deal with it there and there. So, Rich, how are you, brother? I'm good, thank you, Chris. Really good. Thanks for getting me on here. Do you remember Right Said Fred? <laughs> yes, I do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Which one are you? <laughs> I don't know. They both looked identical to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Good band. I'm, I'm too sexy for my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Brother, it's so kind you came on. Thank you. You have the uh, esteemed honour that we have a, um, a wonderful new producer on the podcast, Ben. Hello, Ben, if you if Hi, you ben. watch this. And you are the first person that Ben went, right, get this guy on the show. <laughs> oh, really? Wow, yeah. that's, that's, um, that is a privilege there. Absolutely. Well, I, I saw some of your Facebook stuff. You're clearly a nice guy. Um, Let's just say from the beginning for people watching, the veterans community is just all over the shop at the minute, especially with yeah. social media has made it all so divisive and a, a bit nasty, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. My concern, and I know yours, Rich, is the same, is we're in a suicide epidemic of our brothers and sisters, right? Yeah. And something needs to be done. Yeah. And the old school method of just hiding all our misdemeanors or our mm. not so misdemeanors under the carpet, it doesn't yeah. work anymore. People no. need to talk about substance use. Um, they need to talk about the, the, the laws that we have in this area in the country, which I think any half intelligent observer would say clearly don't work. Well, they work for the people that are making a, a huge load of money off it. Yeah. But at the same time, we're in a situation where if our brothers and sisters can't come forward and say, look, I've got a problem or I've fallen in with this crowd or, you know, I started doing this thing and now it's got a bit out of control. You know, yeah. if, if they if all they're going to get is old sweats going, oh, you shouldn't do this and you should you, because that was the old school mentality. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to be putting more people in boxes or, you know, yeah yeah totally. go into the bloody crematorium even more so for anyone yeah. listening it's called bought the t-shirt podcast for a reason we invite interesting people that can add to our lives and that involves education and um enough said rich i just wanted to sort of lay the table because um yeah cool yeah you know, people get confused in this area but uh take it from the beginning mate shall we yeah, so I mean, I, I served in the, I joined the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment in 1988. Um, back in the 80s, it, it was a very different army. I mean, it all was very different back then. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep this part quite brief because when the Berlin Wall came down in 89, um, they started to reduce the size of the forces over in Germany, which is known as BAOR at the time. Uh, there were a lot of disbandments, amalgamations. There were a lot of redundancies going on. So we amalgamated with the new second Royal Tank Regiment in 1992. All this was, was progressive and seen as the way forward that the, the British Army was going to move along by slowly withdrawing from, from sort of Central Europe, Germany, and, and slowly reducing the number because there was no longer this imminent threat of a Cold War. Um, the unfortunate thing, I think, for a lot of us at the time, we, we, you know, by this, this point, I'd done three or four years. Promotion was good. You were sort of moving along nicely with your... With, with your kind of plan to, to with your, your military career. And the, the, because of the amalgamations, we just slowed down, things just ground to a halt. And at the time we weren't, I wasn't personally seeing the army giving me the future, which I had expected from it. I wasn't uh, hoping to see any active service. I had been to Northern Ireland in 1990. We missed the, the first Gulf War or Iraq War, uh, which was in 1990, early 91, because we were in Northern Ireland. And I thought, I'm never going to see anything. So I kind of thought, well, I'm not going to get promoted again because it's all just ground to a halt. I'm going to get out. Mm. So really in the, in the, the, the sort of mid-90s, say 94, 95, 
there are a huge amount of, of I say soldiers, because that's the, from my perspective, actually leaving the forces, giving up, handing in a notice and just knocking it on the head because there wasn't really much of a career left. It had really slowed down. So I knocked it on the head in 94 to get out in 95. Um, and that's where the problem started. It, it, you, the army makes you, your military training makes you extremely confident in your abilities which is fair enough, you need to be confident in order to carry out your role in, in wherever you're going to be. Um, so I did a course with the, S, with the SBS for close protection. Standard course, it was great, it was fantastic with, with a guy I served with, um, you know, it was, a, it was a company called Task International with down in Maidstone, four weeks, and then you add this other qualification to an already very confident character of, oh, I'm a bodyguard and I'm this, and it just elevates your, your your unrealistic expect expectations so high when you come out that you just think you're better than everything. So you've already set yourself up to fail because what I failed to take into consideration was on coming out of the forces at that time, there was also another however many thousands looking for the same kind of work, the same kind of jobs. So it was really difficult, really, really hard to find steady work. However, I was lucky. I managed to get a job working with my dad, who's ex-police force, um, some colleagues of his doing surveillance. And I did some CP work. And this was fantastic. It was kind of like the right job, but what I wasn't really prepared for was that lack of belonging. When I came out, I missed that camaraderie that was part of the army. And although I was never the big one for being in the Nafi bar, I just missed that, that sort of focus feeling of being involved with people all the time. In a sense, if you had something wrong or you were a bit skinned or you had a problem, there's always someone to go to who would listen to you. Yeah, they will probably give you a slap and tell you to put you know, sort yourself out. But at least you at least you have someone to go to if you're having a bad time. And I kind of miss that sense of belonging. And that's such a big deal for a lot of guys who come out anyway. My thing I wasn't ready for at the same time was I really enjoyed going out. I enjoyed going out clubbing and partying, as did all of my civilian friends. And what I wasn't ready for was this, this crazy dance scene, which is, used to be the rave scene back in the... I think back in the late 80s when he used to go and find a field somewhere and pull up a lorry with a load of speakers and everyone would get completely, completely wasted. This illegal racing had kind of migrated into the clubs around the UK. And I was not ready for that. It wasn't a case of the, the, the drug side of it initially. It was more a case of, wow, what is going on here? Everybody was just having such a good time. And I was doing door work at the time as well. So I was kind of stood on the outside, still looking in. I was never really felt a part of this, this community because I was the one stood on the door saying yes or no, watching everyone else have a good time. And I thought, is this, is this what I've come out to? Is this, is this what it is? So I started put, pulling away from the door work on the weekends and I started going into the clubs and yeah, I started getting introduced into, into drugs. I won't call them recreational drugs because any drug can be recreational if you use it for recreational use. It's a, it's something I thought, so ecstasy was the one. And, and, and I got to be honest, I'm not going to condone this. I can't condone it. But for me, when I took that first pill, I finally felt like I belonged somewhere again. Because for that duration of the, of the effects of ecstasy, whether it be one, two, three or four hours, you feel exactly the same as every other person in that room who's done that drug. So all of a sudden you belong to this group of people. So you get that sense of, being a part of something and that's that is that is a massive problem for girls who've been in the forces because you can easily turn to this and it's so false because you take all these individuals if let's say there's a hundred people there and you're all completely wired to the moon on these drugs and you're all feeling the same way the music and the clothes and you're all on the same level it's, it's so false because you eventually got to come back to reality and the reality is you still have got very little in common with all these people around you doesn't mean they're not good people. It just means that you're just there. You engage in this activity for a while. You feel this false sense of belonging. And then it just goes, it sort of sort of peters out and then, and then it's gone. And you left them with just, just your emotions. And that can be problematic. And, and add this, add, sorry, add to this your extreme risk-taking behavior, which is a lot of us suffer from. We need to do something to satisfy that, that risk because normality for us just, just doesn't fit. We, we, we need something wild to make us feel normal again. And I found that I was beginning to get introduced to the supply of the drugs uh, more so because I've got a business mind. 
and a group of friends that I was with at the time, we always used to engage in these activities on the weekend and go out and get, get wasted, I'll use that word. Um, we needed to find somewhere to, to get our substance from. And, and I thought, oh, I'll do it. You know, it doesn't seem, it can't be as bad as getting shot at or it, I've done worse things in a naffy bar. You know, so you you kind of stick your hands worse. How bad can it be? And it wasn't all of those basic military qualities that you're given in in simple things like patrol, like doing a patrol, simple standard stuff. Just apply those in in that direction. And I thought this this is easy. And again, not condoning it. Please don't think I'm trying to say go out and do it. Use your squaddy skills to do this because I'm not saying that. For me, it felt so natural. Because I've been doing surveillance, I've been doing CP work, I'd, I'd, I'd already done a fair bit of work in the civilian environment, so to, to use my military qualifications in a civil environment was already being applied through, through CP work and surveillance, so this didn't feel any different, it didn't feel wrong, I know it was wrong, but it didn't feel wrong, I mean, if you, you've got to define what wrong is, I mean, for us it's very natural to carry a uh, a loaded weapon around a street which looks like the UK, say in Northern Ireland. That for me felt perfectly normal. The streets would look just like the ones outside your front door in the UK. That's normal for me. So this whole definition of normality and what's right and wrong is a very wavy line. Or it was for me, especially when you're kind of half charged on, on drugs on a weekend, perfectly you know, functioning within the week. So what I found was my CP work began to fade away because there were so many people looking for that work I needed to survive and along with really bad money management skills which I learned perfectly well from the army about how to spend it weekend millionaires you spend it all on the weekend you've got nothing left but then you know you've got your muckers to, to pull you through the month you can go down the cookhouse and <laughs> you're going to be okay aren't you you're going to survive um I slowly moved into selling ecstasy and really for me it felt like a very that was a natural transition from coming out of the forces and I just slightly went a little bit left and I just gone completely sideways yeah and it was it became a new way of life for me because it addressed all of the issues that I was dealing with because it gave me the risk it gave me an income barely gave me an income because it was a lifestyle and it was the lifestyle which replaced my military lifestyle and I functioned quite happily. You know, I was never, I would never say I was an addict with drugs because I didn't ever walk down the route of taking substances which were highly addictive. You know, I, I, it's not me, I'm not an addictive person. Um, so yeah, that's really where it went from there. And it was just a lot of ecstasy, ecstasy cells up and down the country and it just grew and it grew and it grew um, to the point where really in 2002, I then opted to, look into the cocaine market because that's to see market it really kind of there's not believe it, there's not much money made on it you've got to sell a lot of those things to actually survive you know and it only takes a couple of things going wrong and trust me things go wrong all the time it's a very untrustworthy uh, uh industry is is the drugs game you know, people are out to rob you in all different ways. They might want to rob you by giving you something which isn't worth the money you've paid for. They might just send some around your house to kick your door off and take the drugs from you or the money. It's very problematic. And you're having to deal with these things on a, on a, almost on a daily basis. And it takes its toll on your mental health. I mean, the only way I can describe, somebody asked this a while ago, because I had some work done with, um, with PTSD, not from combat, but from my nefarious activities. And, we'd realized that to be involved in the drugs industry and to do it properly at certain levels, and I'll probably go into that shortly, um, you're under a huge amount of stress. It's like being on operational duties. Imagine being over in Afghanistan, um, being ready. You, you, you're half cocked, always at the ready, just in case something goes wrong. I've never been there. I'm, not, I'm just using that as an example for, for, for lads currently and, and the ladies currently. You imagine being on that tour for 15 years. Right. That's the kind of stress, the, the, it never goes away. It never, even when you go on holiday, it never goes away. It's still there. Because even if you're not actively selling things and you're still in that world, you might have a week off. Well, I'm having a week off this week and they go on holiday with my, my wife and my kids. And you can't switch off because you've got your phone. You Every day you're waiting for a message to come through. It's gone wrong. We've got a problem. So-and-so has been arrested. Your door's just gone off. We owe them money. They... It, the, the problems are endless and you don't ever get a chance to have any downtime, no rest. 
that's why I think a lot of people involved in drugs, you see them being very flash. You see them having holidays. They've got the nice cars because in the back of their mind, they must know that any minute that world's going to come crashing down around them. They're going to lose everything. It doesn't make it right. It just means I think that's why they, if they live by the sword, they know they're going to probably come unstuck very soon. So it takes its toll. Yeah, I always used to say, and this is not a, like a, not at all a judgment or value call, but like if you deal substances, you're either going to die or you'll end up in prison. It's It, yeah. it was always how it was, right? In yeah. my... Um, what am I saying, Rich? In my, uh, let, I'm not cl including alcohol here, which many of you people listening will know that I, as a substance misuse specialist, have to tell you the truth. Alcohol is the worst drug. It just mm -hmm. is. Yeah. If you don't understand why, go go and research the the effects of it on people. Go and research how many people die every day from from alcoholism and it's really not nice but taking the alcohol out of the equation because obviously we all started when we was 18 and hitting it hard in the forces <laughs> yeah the, the substance misuse area or the substance use area i've got like too many years you know 25 years experience of it of, of it now both as a professional and a, as as someone that's experienced mental health problems so we're talking addiction and yeah. someone like you say who's gone out and had a bloody good party and learned an awful lot about myself right mm -hmm. but just to pick back up on that point yeah i in, in all of that time rich i've only ever known one guy he's made it all the way through and it um <laughs> it doing his it and he made quite a lot of money from it, right? Yeah. Um, I think the thing that probably saved him is he did a round. So you never like went to his house, or I mean, if yeah. if you knew the guy, obviously you did. But he'd do a round every, mm -hmm. e the same two days every week. He'd do his round, and yeah. I don't know. The cops must have known his name, but yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it, it like you say, high stress environment. Isn't it? Am I going to die yeah. today? Am I going to go get my door smashed in and my life changes yeah. forever? You kind of get to six in the morning every morning, and you, you you kind of half awake thinking, "Is this the day?" And you get to half six, you think, "All oh, right, another day now. I can get up and just move on." You know, but it, and it isn't just your door smashed off by the police. It it could be another firm, and that's why you have to be so secretive about your whole life. You know, and we taught on our, on our CP course, I said, be consistently inconsistent is something I always did. That's hard work <laughs> over so much time. It really takes a drain on your, your everything. It's so much energy used in not being caught. And now that that's finally gone, you've got so much energy left in reserve to, to apply in the right direction. It's quite liberating, you know, it really makes a massive difference huge change to your life coming out of it and you're right about saying there's only two ways you're either you're either going to get dead or get caught the only way is the other way is you might just make it through you might but it's very rarely anyone actually gets through that world and makes the money they want to and not have some kind of damage en route whether it's to themselves or their family there's always going to be some kind of damage or some kind of collateral damage which you've got to manage or deal with and you've got to live with that you know, I think you have to be ruthless mm. to get through that world, totally ruthless. And and that that comes in many different forms. It could be ruthless as in extremely violent. You could end up being just sort of ruthless as in you don't really care about anyone around you. So therefore, if you do get caught, you may go down the route of being an informant. And no matter which route you take, you're going to end up very lonely, very, very lonely, because that's just the nature of it. People just won't want to be around you or you, you'll either have no friends for any reason and it's a very lonely existence and it's not the existence i think that a veteran deserves or needs to it's not for anyone but people who serve for the country you just get re pigeonholed as someone that was you fought for your country that's great clap clap hero everything everything else and then you 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 go to prison for whatever reason and all of a sudden you're pigeonholed as a, as a convict or oh, it's not very becoming of a veteran and, and and it's not 
it's not we should know better but we don't have much guidance do we when they come out we tend to just sort of find their own way and usually goes wrong yeah it, it, we should point out rich it's a murky area though isn't it because as we i think we said at the beginning of the podcast or, or even before the drug laws are incredibly they're inconsistent they're unfair that they, they they don't work and they yeah. benefit you know certain groups in society that don't care about guys like me and you right that's right or or, or the the hundreds of thousands of people that struggle with addiction on a daily basis yeah. so addiction it's a mental health condition generally born out of childhood trauma so you've been a beaten up little kid yeah. who then struggles to make sense of it as an adult when this trauma repeats yeah substances initially get rid of that trauma and you're, you're like i'm ace i'm i'm like everyone else now right and that's yeah. where that cycle kicks in yeah rather than recognize this trauma what do they do they make your mental health problems illegal which is just it, that's as yeah. stupid as making the flu illegal right yeah <laughs> let's not even go let's not even go <laughs> go there now right but i i mentioned this mate because you're very humble yeah. and i get it veterans very often are like you're like i did wrong it's like I, I I don't think you did wrong. I, 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 I'm not suggesting anyone follows your, you know, your lead or my lead. Mm. As I always say, Rich, you live your life, right? I'll live mine. That then we're happy then, aren't we? You know? Yeah. Um yeah. I just mention it because the out of the dance era that you said, I mean, God, so yeah. many of us learn an awful lot about ourselves. Yeah. About life about okay it was a false community when your head's sort of in the clouds but yeah. but it also showed you actually that what community was that you know yeah, yeah. three thousand people can come together in a field on dartmoor <laughs> and the worst thing that happens all night is a you have a bloody good time yeah and you hug the girl or the guy next to you right yeah and and that's what it was it was it was un, it was just wasn't ready for that kind of um atmosphere and everything associated with that whole lifestyle just seemed so appealing at the time and and when you've been and the way that i kind of sort of say is when i used to go and leave and I've, i think a lot of veterans will probably relate to this whenever you go and leave you see your friends and family they're all very happy to see you back again but you never really you don't really ever fit back into that circle again because they they were your circle of friends and when you leave and join the forces you become different you change you 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 adapt to a, a new lifestyle with 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 the people you're serving with so when you come out you've always kind of wrongly or rightly so you kind of almost elevate yourself above or beyond that group because of maybe some of the experiences that you've had you've got the the, the old, you weren't there man kind of attitude and it's very hard to reintegrate back into that group of friends again. So when you come out, you still feel like this outsider was never in. And, and that lifestyle gave me a way to, to build this um, circle around me, like, a, I suppose, like a comfort blanket. I created my own circle. I created my own environment with once I started becoming the, the person that was providing the drugs. I then and, and the drugs then became irrelevant is the fact that people came, came to me. They came into my circle. And I felt comfortable with that because I had control over that circle. And it's not about being in control. It's about being a part of something which, which, which I felt like I belonged. And that was the strange thing about it. I was no longer this person, this, this person satellite around this group of friends. I created my own bubble and it was a big bubble and it was great. And I, and I felt that weirdly at the time, it, it was like an achievement and it, was, it wasn't a great achievement. But for me personally, at, at the time, it kind of got me through that transition and albeit completely in the wrong direction, I kind of survived it. I went, no, I went off on a tangent really badly when I went into cocaine. That was when the world completely changed for me. But in the ecstasy days, it was just, it was just nice because there wasn't any real major stress at the time. The stress comes with cocaine. That's when it completely changes. Mm -hmm. and the, the state I become different. I should just clarify again for people listening, because we're not here to upset anyone. No. Yes, when you're hugging in the field and you're having a good old dance off, 
there will be people and i was one of them that will take the party home and then they'll have then they'll kick the party off the next day and we're talking a party for one now right it's called addiction right yeah. you don't want that feeling of happiness to stop because yeah. you know you've never actually felt comfortable in your whole life and yeah. I'm making this in simplistic terms so as many people can understand as possible. Yeah. Yeah. The other side of the coin is what is legal is drinking 10 pints of poison, going down down a main street in your city and beating the, the, the shit out of a complete stranger, leaving them, you know, in intensive care, right? Kicking someone's head in because they try and get in a taxi before you. Yeah. throwing up your, your kebab over some complete stranger right yeah, yeah going home right creating domestic violence right i'm i'm, I'm painting and that is another culture yeah that, that you, you know we what, what i'm trying to say is let, let's all stop judging each other mm. that is still a drug still a poison yeah. still has massive issues and yet that scenario is completely mm. legal the hugging each other in a field and having a dance and then you know spending the next day like watching shit on tv and eating peeps because you feel so bad it, 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 um yes Sorry. it's really valid Chris, you know because the, that's a really interesting point because when we when i was in this little circle of friends and we were all taking ecstasy at the time and we were on this different level just dancing just having a good time there was never any problems uh, with it, the only time we would encounter a problem, and again, this isn't me trying to justify anything, is if there'd be a group of lads would turn up and they were clearly drunk, I mean, completely drunk, we would then think, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. Because you're thinking, as dr drunken lads turn up, our mix was a mix of, of, of guys and girls, you know, and we think this is just going to be a nightmare because we don't want the trouble. We just want to enjoy ourselves. And then people who were, you know, who've had a few too many would come out, they start get going all, all over the girls and they'd be pushing us around. We think we just don't want the issue. And I suppose that was the difference between us at the time was involved in that. It was very peaceful and non-violent. Uh, like back in the 60s, I guess. It was very, very loving and nice. But people who were drunk, it was a very different feeling. It doesn't mean they were going to cause a problem. It just seemed like they were because of our perception of we we're all loved up and they clearly weren't. You know, but you're right. It's, it was they both have bring so many different problems, you know, in, in their own way. But yeah, it was um, tough. There was a very defining moment on the dance scene. And I'm talking the city where I lived. And things changed when they shut the big warehouses down. And then it the scene tried to move into other clubs. But then those clubs were trying to cater to drinkers. Yeah. and the pill takers right they were trying to get so come the late night clubs that would stay open till say seven in the morning yeah you'd get this bizarre scenario where at five o'clock you got one half of the people they're all up you know <laughs> giving it large on the dance floor loved up not going to arm a fly and then you had these drunken swaggerers stood there like this <laughs> like yeah. with either confusion on their face yeah like why are these people so happy what why am i you know yeah or anger they were yeah. they they were not happy that you know there's a guy there dancing with five girls yeah why How's... smiling his head off and here i am on my own like absolutely fucking wrecked yeah and that's a really good point because i think um when you're in that state of mind, i.e. On, on, on those particular drugs, you're having a great time. You're not really interested in, in getting laid, if I may say that. If you're not interested, you just want to have a good time. You know, when you're drunk, a drunken lad, generally speaking, you go out from, from one of two reasons. You get you know, one of three, one drink, just a drink, have a scrap, or to find the young lady for the night. And if you're drunk and you're seeing these really attractive girls dance and having a great time, and you're thinking, why aren't they interested in me? Then you're right, the resentment kicks in, the anger kicks in. Then you've got to deal with all kinds of problems. And, and when you're wired to the moon on ecstasy, the last thing you want to be doing is getting involved in a fight because you just don't want it. It doesn't mean you're not, because your, your sense is so alert, you're so wired and you're so aware of everything around you that 
you, you've no idea of what you may or may not be capable of at that time. Mm. You think, I'd just rather avoid it. <laughs> you know, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's a funny time, funny transition for, for yeah. drinkers especially. Could talk again about when it started to become the norm to mix alcohol with with the substance and that just produced a real horrible type of person mm, um, yeah. yeah again I, maybe we should come on to this because coke is the thing as well isn't it that can really really affect yeah. people's psyche yeah it was do you know what when we were it was round about let's say back about, about 2000 1999 2000 and i was kind of thinking that the ecstasy was really getting very difficult to to live on not as a substance but to financially to to, to survive and people around who've been clubbing for these four or five years had, had slowly started to go home from the club on the night instead of taking more pills they, they might get a bit of, bit of coke on board or have a smoke, bit of smoke just to try and find a way to sort of numb the night out and just just try and we're all getting a bit older now trying to sort of draw the night out and just finish it and i think that's when it started to change when everyone went from being this circle of friends that enjoyed dancing to go into a pub before you go in the club and oh, let's have a little let's have a little sneaky little line and all of a sudden you become very subdued and then that's what people can be seen as being quite arrogant if they're on cocaine because you become subdued and you don't really converse in the same way. So then you're drinking heavily and you can drink a ridiculous amount of alcohol and not actually be drunk. You find the balance between the two. And that's when it really changed for me because that circle of friends that I used to go out and enjoy clubbing with were no longer clubbing. They were buying cocaine. And I thought, well, I better start selling this then really because I'm not really selling that many pills anymore and I've, I've clearly not got a job which is any good so I need to start thinking about uh, an income and by then this this has already become my life by then this we're talking four years down the road and it was it's never too late to come out of it but for me at that time I was already in it I was already in it and it was a conscious decision at the time to keep going as I was until at least I knew what was going on so I started to sell cocaine on small amounts and I think it really changed in 2002 when I started to go into a, a little bit, a little bit bigger. Um, and this is from the dealing and supply side of it. I wouldn't really take that much. I dabbled now and again because my wife at the time we'd had our first son in 1999. So I was married in 2002. So, and they didn't know anything about it. Clearly my son didn't, he was a baby. My wife, my family, my dad, nobody knew anything about my illegal activities. I was very, very secretive. I, I hid everything really well. Um, and I blame my military training for that. You know, I'm not blaming them, but that's that's one of the, the ways that I use that is to be able to sort of manage to sort of keep it under wraps. And the to stakes, when you're selling cocaine, they change dramatically. The, the financial gains and losses but not just that the people involved in that industry it becomes a very greedy and manipulative industry and i think that's when the problems really began because it, it just becomes but you get used to it you just adjust your life to allow for these different characters you adjust your 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 stress levels to deal with these kind of numbers and in if if in it, back in the time that we're talking what 20 years ago when i was selling ecstasy um financially if you were to buy ten thousand let's say ten thousand pills it might cost me about four thousand pound this is all done on credit it's all done on ticks so imagine if it goes wrong you've still got to pay for it mm. so when you're buying cocaine at the time you might buy a quarter of a kilo and it might cost you um eight or nine thousand pounds so the, the financially the, the substances that you were handling, say volume-wise, volume, volume wise, were so much less, but the cost so much more. And the greed and the manipulation was just, was frightening. And then you're looking at trying to sort of find your way through the market. And that's when you start coming into not so much like territorial wars, but you certainly got people who say, right, no, you have to buy it from me or we have to do it this way. And then and people are trying to, have you over by selling me stuff which isn't really what it's meant to be and, and it becomes really really quite scary at times there have been some times when i thought this this is going to go really south this is going to go wrong but yeah it wasn't it was 
horrible. It was horrible. I don't think I ever really truly enjoyed myself when I was for the what from 02 for about 10 years selling cocaine. I don't think I ever really sat back and thought, I'm having a great time. No, I don't think I ever managed that. You mask that with the money that you could potentially earn by doing the things that you've maybe never been able to afford to do had you not sold these things. But it's all tainted because in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, this is all going to go soon. It's all going to be taken away from me. I'm going to be in prison. I'm going to lose my life. My wife or my kids are going to get kidnapped. That's always in the back of my mind. And if people are going into that world and they're not having that in there, then they're wrong. These things happen. And if you're not ready for it, which I always was, then it's going to hit you that much harder. But it's like you're stressed about something which might not actually happen, but I'd rather sit there and be mentally prepared for it than not. Really bad. Really, really horrible. There's something else we should point out for our, you know, for our young people that potentially see this as a glamorous area or somewhere where they can get a shortcut to, to make a bit of cash is yes you will you will this business is renowned for making a lot of money quite quickly right Mm. but what happens is it's not really there's no key transferable skills in this profession it's very it's a one single thing that you do yeah let's forget all the looking over your shoulder every day which is just no way to live anyway right But what happens is you will get busted. You will. You will get cocky. You'll get blasé. One silly little thing, insignificant, like maybe you nick a Mars bar in a shop without thinking, get caught. And then when they search you, you've got something in your pocket. So they go to your house, right? This kind of stuff. Not to mention, obviously, you're going to get grassed up because there's, you know, so many informants out there. Yeah. So then you're so you've wasted three years in a dead end career doing this thing. Mm. You then get banged up for three years. Yeah. That's six years. You right. What happens in that six years? All your mates have leapfrog you. Mm. They've now got houses, mortgages they pay. They're working hard. They've gone into higher education. You know, maybe that doesn't work. So they try something else. And. I've seen this in, in people I know and people I love where they come out the neck. What are they? They're basically no different to when they left school. They've got nothing, right? Yeah. So what do they do to try to get that kudos back? Because when we're young, we operate out of our ego. They go, I'm going to do another deal. And everyone goes, when you were banged up, you said you was never going to do that again. Yeah. You were crying in your letters. We all went to visit you and support you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And look what you've done for all our support. You come straight. And this is not a lecture, guys. I'm just trying to it's, sell a story it's, here, right? You yeah. come back out. You realize you're not Mr. Big Shot anymore. And your ego wants that kudos back. So you're going to go and do this thing. And what happens? Three years later, bang, arrested again. So you don't just get three years now, now you get the five. Yeah. And then yeah. what happens? You come out and... It, and you're off then, aren't you? You're, you're a repeat offender. Um, and Rich, I don't know if you will agree with me, but I say to anyone, knock that stuff on it. It's not worth it. Go and learn something. Start yeah. your own business. Start yeah. a YouTube chat. Try yeah. and write a book. Yeah. Go and study a course at night school. This yeah. ultimately you'll become happier and more yeah. wealthier if that's your thing, yeah, you know, more secure, yeah. let's say, than if you do the shortcut career. Yeah, there's so many guys. When I was in prison, um, I used to be a mentor for I used to sort support veterans anyway, and that's something else. But um, I used to be a mentor and support guys coming in, and I'd help them with the journey through the prison. So these 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 people might have been on the first sentence or then it could be in multiple times and when they come in actually makes you make a conscious decision to this is it i'm going to change i've been in too many times you can see the difference in their in their mindset they are totally liberated and, and they're so enthusiastic to learn because you've got education in prison you've got you can learn some basic trades or you you can if you if you've got time you can apply yourself and and you know, develop your own plans 
when you see the people and, and they said about using the amount of energy you use into not getting caught, when they finally realize that they haven't got to waste that energy on, on hiding and, and being evasive anymore, and they apply that to something which is going to benefit their future, you see the difference, what they can achieve in such a short space of time. And they actually, but what they require, and this, this comes for anyone, is prison's very good at encouraging you to change and to make you um, better yourself, reform is obviously the word that we use. That's great until you walk out of the prison doors. Now, probation are equally good, but they're there to safeguard the public and to ensure that you're adhering to certain conditions, which I understand that it's about safeguarding the public against anyone who's got, who's, who's a risk or a danger. They haven't always necessarily got the, fun, the funding or the finance or the time and staff to help you continue on your journey of reform. I'm lucky I've, I've did everything myself inside because I had such a long sentence. I had time to get this done. But some of the guys on a shorter sentence, when they come out, they've, they've been patted on the back by the people who've been looking after them for the last you know, one, two, three years or months, whatever. They're encouraged. Yeah, this is a great idea. But as soon as you come out of prison, you kind of down to, it's down to themselves and they don't get that continued encouragement. So it's very quick for them to be really enthusiastic. But then they got to add this to the fact they're coming out of prison. Are they going to a house? Are they going, what's, what's their personal circumstances? Have they got anywhere to go? Have they, have they still got support from their family. There's so many other things they've got to take into consideration as well as this master plan they've got about putting life back on track. And that's where it normally comes unstuck. And it's very much the same as coming out of the forces. You, you come out of such a big, secure environment with these great plans. And we are, a lot of the time, unfortunately quite delusional with with what we think we, we hope to achieve with what with our qualifications i know the ccp are doing some great things now but there's so many holes there's so many gaps for young veterans who are coming out of forces and they've, they've got these plans and it only takes a couple of knocks a couple of falls and you kind of your confidence goes then you get on the drink or the drugs and then it goes even further so you're on that slippery slope fairly quickly but this can happen at any time you know, we, we carry a lot of demons inside of us from what we've been around, what we've seen. And mental health can creep up on you. It can creep up on you. And, and you know, before you know it, you're really in a really bad place. So, yeah, it's hard. It's really hard coming out of uh, with, with these qualifications and, and trying to make that change. It has to be a conscious decision in your own mind. I am going to definitely do this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let anything get in my way. I'm going to succeed. And that can drive you a long way. And that's what I'm trying to do at the minute. Rich, seeing as though you're our man, the man that knows a lot about this stuff, let, let's just talk about Coke itself. Yeah. Um, or what what they... Well, there's two kinds, isn't there? There's the real stuff and then what they sell on the streets of... <laughs> yeah, and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. Everyone was doing it. Everybody around me was, was no longer doing it. See, they were doing cocaine and... It just everything changed dramatically and because i was the one supplying it i wasn't ever involved in selling on the streets i never got involved in selling grams i just kind of jumped from selling ecstasy to going straight into say quarter kilos of cocaine so i never really got involved in i was never on the front line as such but because i was people that knew me they looked at me differently now they didn't see me as their friend rich they see me as someone Oh, he's, he's really sort of stepped up a little bit now. So they, they kind of looked and treated me differently. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be treated like Rich. The person that I got to know them is, some of them is really good friends, but they never saw me that way anymore. And then the more I got involved in it and the more I kind of distanced myself from people around me that I cared about, because that's when I had to, because my life was really starting to change and I kind of wanted a way out of it now. And I was always looking for a way out. Once I got involved in Coke, there were too many problems, too many issues, and the money was never as good as, a, as it should have been because you're always paying for someone else's mistake. Someone's been arrested. And the problem with Coke is if you sell, we call it a nine bar, which is nine ounces, which is you've got the whole imperial and then you've got the metric, and it's it's not confusing, but it is, <laughs> but it can be. Uh, I would sell someone, let's, let's say an ounce of cocaine for a thousand pounds for argument's sake. Now, I've taken this stuff on credit, so I owe someone £9,000, or I owe someone £8,000. My profit would have been, let's say, £1,000 for argument's sake. Again, it may or may not have been. One person has a mistake or a problem that you've sold to, 
or they haven't got the money or they've decided to stick the lot up their nose for the weekend, all of a sudden you haven't got your profit. So you then got hope that the other eight people pay you without fault. Bear in mind, you've got, also still got to pay wages for your runners, X, Y, Z. It could be £500 in wages. So already you're running at a deficit. You've already lost £500. One other person gets a problem, you're, you're short, you're late. You haven't got the money for the guy that you owe the money to. And these are the people that don't really like to be given. <laughs> they want their money <laughs> regardless. So it doesn't take much to turn a potentially lucrative deal into an absolute nightmare. And let's say all across the board, all nine people, they all have a little problem. They all come up 250 quid short. You're already down again. So then what you've got to do then, you've got to start, right, I need to start cutting this stuff to allow for their mistakes, to allow to ensure that I at least can pay my bill. And that's before you've made any money. So imagine the stress on top of your neck because already you're, you're changing the dynamic of the, of the business. You're now getting involved in messing with the substance which has already been messed with. So you run risks of adding something to this and it's all usually quite benign substances. And I won't say what they are, but you add something to it, which you know should be okay, but you don't know what's been put in it before. So if you put something in there and it reacts with what's already in there, you've just destroyed nine grand's worth of substances, which you still have to pay for and is unsellable because it might turn into, it might, it's, it's chemicals. There are chemicals in there and they will react in some way. And I've had things which I've tried to push a little bit further, should I say, and it's gone, it's turned into a slimy mess. I think, what am I going to do with this? What? And, and all of a sudden you're, you're nine grand in debt. So then you've got to figure out how am I going to get out of that debt? Then you've got to start buying stuff in and, and cutting it again with something which isn't going to react. And, and it becomes an absolute nightmare. So that's just even before you've made any money. So that if that's not enough to put someone off, <laughs> I don't know what it is. It is really, really precarious path about you can make money if you're in the right place at the right time and you are ruthless and you don't want any friends you're still going to get caught and you're still going to be lonely and you're still going to be stressed out and you're still probably going to die at some point but the rest of it is just it's really hard work and it is stressful yes especially when you see it all completely fall apart on you Yeah, I want to chip in here, Rich, with something else. Um, so there was that thing, wasn't there, on the dance scene? Yeah. When I first started going out, if you bought one Love Dove or a Calais, as they were, <laughs> you know, Calais, yeah. Calais was a very, for people listening, a very strong ecstasy pill. It just sends you a bit do lally, you know. Um, but you pay 15 quid, right? 15 quid. And I had mates that would pop five on a night out. Yeah. I don't even know where they got the money for. Well, some of them had their own businesses, <laughs> right? And then we saw this situation. And I'm guessing it was related to the fact that ecstasy is synthesized or, or it's produced from the saf safro tree, is it, in Cambodia? Right? Okay. They dig up this tree, they chainsaw the root off it, and that contains the main chemical that's synthesized into ecstasy or whatever the, the whatever that word is, right? For the MDMA, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not it's it's not hard to see that this tree is going to be harvested out of existence, right? <laughs> the reason I mention it is because overnight, almost overnight, the pills went from being 15 quid to a quid right yeah. 1997 yeah a quid yeah right now they still had an effect on you right what wasn't quite the same as the old the old school stuff which sent you to this just god that just put you on a i'm not even gonna say it was a cloud it's not it there isn't words to describe it right um this isn't a recommendation people go and do it but <laughs> Now, the same thing, right, happened with bass. Do you remember bass, right? Yeah, speed and bass, wasn't yeah. it? 
when I got back from Hong Kong, because I couldn't buy crystal meth in the UK, you could get it if you were, I think if you're on the gay scene, there were places, you know, there were ways to get it. Yeah. Um, but the next best thing to crystal meth was base amphetamine. So methamphetamine, but just not purified to its crystal form, right? Yeah. And then the day came along and it took quite a while, but it was about, say, let's say 2005-ish. Yeah. Where suddenly this stuff that you bought from your guy, it's, this ain't the same. Yeah. It doesn't even smell. It doesn't have that. Anyone knows the smell will know what I'm saying. It, it, yeah. yeah. And again, it was some chemical synthesis. Yeah. Where clearly, they didn't have the right ingredients. My guess would have been the powers that be brought stricter laws out on what the chemical companies could sell and what they couldn't sell and who to, right? So companies like, I don't know, ICI or whatever, the, the big bulk distributors of barrels yeah. of chemicals in this company, probably then had to be a bit more, um, you know, accountable for who, yeah. who, you know, are you selling this to some farmer who has got, a, yeah. you know, a barn in North Devon with a, with a copper bathtub in it, which is <laughs> part of the process for making speed for anyone listening. Um, so there, there was that, right? Then there was the fact that any time you bought this cocaine, so it was just fucking shit. Excuse my French, but it was just, yeah. at, you get some scrawny little spotty geezer yeah. that would sell you this 50 quid. And it was, it, and I say, I can say that because obviously I've, I've traveled every single country in the Americas. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a fascinating subject just to be aware of down there. For yeah. example, when you're in places like Honduras, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, such places, bales of cocaine wash ashore there, right? Yeah. And they come from the smuggling boats from South America, so these high-powered speed boats. Yeah. But when they see a spotter plane, they just chuck it all overboard, right? And it washes up on the beaches in Central America, and the locals go, oh, okay. <laughs> i'll have that yeah little bit for themselves the yeah. rest of it sold and so in any region in that part of the world colombia venezuela even as far as when you start getting across to guyana it very much more becomes crack because it's yeah. uh when you're in guyana it's very georgetown it's very ghettoized it's yeah it's where they were all sent down as slaves and then yeah. at some point in our colonial histories, they got their freedom. Yeah. But they still live in freaking poverty down there, you know. Yeah. A rock of crack, what will cost you 10 or 15 quid in the West, yeah. you you buy for for a dollar down there, you know. It's yeah. it's I maybe shouldn't be advertising that, but <laughs> it was off everyone's off over there. <laughs> but what I can tell you, you know, from my uh, adventures is like bloody hell, you buy that stuff in Colombia, it's it's a even Hong Kong, funny enough, it's just a yeah. different animal, right? I think you're, you're right because if you look at the, the the transit route, which it will take from say South America across to the Canaries and into maybe North Africa up through Spain and so on and so forth, it starts off over in South America, a couple of grand, maybe four up to four grand for maybe a kilo, and then the the further the closer it gets to the UK, the less pure it becomes and the more expensive it gets. So by the time it's, I mean, I, my, my prices are way going to be way off. I haven't been near it since 2010. Um, you know, that's when I was arrested or, or that's when my investigation started. So the prices we were paying back in the UK then were something around about 60 grand for a kilo of coke. And that probably wasn't completely pure. It's probably about 70%. 10 years previous to that, I think in about 2001 or no, 02, so less than 10 years, it was half the price. And better so it fluctuates so much depending on the rest how much gets across the water it's, it's like any other commodity it, ha it it does vary in price quality quality and everything else so you're right over in the south america is a totally different animal um compared to when it gets here but as soon as the the, the businessmen get hold of it i say businessmen as in the top end people they'll start mixing it spreading it repackaging it uh, you know most people have rarely seen 
the, the real stuff. Rarely, there could be placebos to make it look like it's real, but rarely see it. Yeah, the, the companies that make these hydraulic presses have must have made a fortune in the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they, make, so wrong. <laughs> they re block it with Novocaine and all this stuff, don't they? And yeah, yeah, we, we used to buy various things from, like, say, about the, the chemicals, but you can buy large drums of various substances which you can use to to mix it with and they are perfectly safe things because they're used in most other medicines of some sort and then you bear them on the quantities that you're probably going to be taken on board if you're putting it up your nose are less than you would if you were to take it through correct medicinal reasons so, so it's kind of morally i suppose if there is such a thing morally well at least i'm not cutting it was something dangerous but you're still selling drugs aren't you you're still selling crap onto the streets of the uk but kind of morally thinking all these rumors have always been cut with rat poison or this no why would you do that why would you want to kill potentially good customers yeah um, of course you, you, it doesn't happen unless someone's trying to maliciously spike you or cause you a problem what i want to come on to rich is again we went through all that hassle of scoring and waiting for your dealer. Oh my God, who's ever waited for a dealer? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Now you've got all this county line stuff, you know, where the, the, the big crimbo send a young lad out. He, he, he ensconces in a, in a rural community, possibly mm. blackmailing or threatening a local person maybe with learning disability or something like oh, i'm living in your house right or yeah. they feed someone who's got addiction problems and that's yeah. the route that they get to stay in someone's house i'm guessing they secrete the gear in the local area so nothing is traceable back to them yeah they then have a, a, a burner phone and they hand out numbers to everyone with the the prices of the gear on the back yeah and they're you know they they either travel back to the inner city themselves and shove something more down their underpants and get on the train. They're so young, they get under the radar of the police, blah, 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 blah. Right. So from that perspective, it's become a bit easier to sort all this stuff out. Right. And I'm not, again, I'm not like saying that's good or whatever. I'm just, just for the sake of education here. But the thing I wanted to say is you go for all that hassle. What you get is now crap anyway. Yeah. Right. Plus you risk, you, your guys are risk, risking getting arrested. You're getting, risking getting, getting arrested. Da, 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 da. All the hassle, the time, even if you can get the stuff. Mm. Now you got the dark web. Right? Yeah. yeah buy it online apparently <laughs> well let you know i'm, I'm not going to say too much though although we no. i'm not saying anything friends that you can't see in a vice documentary or even a bbc yeah. documentary they discuss yeah. all of this right all of it but basically as long as you are even <clears throat> slightly internet savvy right and the only reason you need savviness is that you dealing you talking code right and you need to have to encrypt your code right it's it's even your gran could learn it like in an hour right mm. sorry gran <laughs> even your granddad could learn it in an hour yeah um and lo and behold for a price cheaper than on the street you got the pure stuff from bolivia right at half the price sent you through the post. <laughs> it's insane because I saw something on the one I was still inside a couple of years ago. I actually saw a documentary about this. And it was about a group of lads planning their night out. And they said they they'd gone onto the web. They didn't show the the search engine of what they were doing. They just yeah. showed him ordering this substance on there. And it was so clear, but in, encoded. I thought, how does that work with someone not getting caught? And he was hoping that his delivery arrives in time before he goes on a Saturday night. And I thought, that's insane. From a business perspective, it's great. It's just, it's just like, you know, that that's just phenomenal. But I think, how does that work? Someone's going to get caught. That, surely there must be, there are very clever people in GCHQ who are going to crack these codes. But they did on, did on these encrypted phones a few months ago, whereas a massive set of arrests right across Europe 
So they'll get caught eventually. We'll crack these codes eventually. The thing is, Rich, right, is yes, you're right. There's always a way to infiltrate these kind of networks, right? But you got to remember, or we've got to remember, it's en masse now. Yeah. And are the police really going to be bothered about Sid up the road who's getting a quarter of, of wacky backy for his yeah. Friday night? Right. Yeah. So all I'm not going to say the websites or any uh, anything like that. But but uh, but the basis way that it works is the money side of it's all encrypted. It's all it's not even Bitcoin. It's it's more encrypted money systems than that. Yeah. So even if the 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 bill are looking at the money system, they can't work out where this money's coming. It's all encrypted. You know, it, it's all encrypted, right? Yeah. On top of that, you you know, it's not just like you can sign up for it like eBay. There's other measures in slightly in place. Let's say. Yeah. On top of that, as I said, you you encrypt all your information in code, which only you or the person you give your cipher to can can decode, right? Yeah. Yeah. On top of that, right? Unless I'm guessing you're probably a bit stupid, you ain't going to put your name on that <laughs> no. that package, right? You're no. going to put John Smith, aren't you? What? Why wouldn't you? Because yeah, then, when it does, you know, when it does come to your door, yeah. if let's just say a sniffer dog at the post office has gone ruff, 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 right, well, it says John, it's not for you, you know, yeah. it, you just say sorry, officer. I've obviously got the wrong house, haven't they? Right, right. Yeah. This, and so in amongst all that, we've got the. You know, the little man in the street who just wants to go for a party on a Friday or a Saturday night, but buying a, such an insignificant amount that the police work that would have to go in to yeah. proving that was actually his, right? Yeah, yeah. And that he'd paid for it through digital currency. He, you're talking like yeah. you need 30 police officers, what, to bust a guy who's ordered a quarter of dope, <laughs> you know, or, or, in, or yeah. right? So you've got all that. I don't know if obfuscation is the right word, but in amongst that, you got people buying big stuff, right? Yeah. You're, you, you know, you're talking. How do I know all this? I, I, I stayed with somebody in in Central Europe. They showed, they explained it all to me, and they showed me the the, the product, right? Yeah. So all the stuff that we've said you can't get anymore. Wrong. Right. Yeah. Um. And yeah, so what in amongst that, if you want to buy a kilo of the stuff, your, your price is there. Yeah. You know, your price is there. And the only risk is, is that it gets intercepted. Yeah. Chances are probably that's maybe, I don't know, one in a hundred thousand chance. Yeah. So your profits already quite safe, aren't they? You know, if one one consignment in a hundred thousand goes missing, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's it it's kind of like the old way of doing it is a bit like the mugs game now, isn't it? I think so. I think that the the old fashioned um, boots on the ground, if you like, it's it's becoming digital. It's, they're using already an already approved infrastructure like the Royal Mail or anything else to do their or they're running for them. All they're doing is literally taking an order, and, and they're like a an outlet aren't they online outlet mm. and and that's something that's all really been developed while i've been away and i come out and although i had no intention of going back into that world i'm thinking even if i had the wildest idea of going back into it i wouldn't stand a chance with the way things have moved on and technology i thought it would just be crazy and there's some very clever people looking at things who are, who are very tech savvy and utilizing what they've got around them and like i say to use an already approved system like the, the royal mail delivery system is you know it's, it's clever but there, there, there will come a time when people eventually they they get caught for other reasons or they they have to launder the money they have to find a way to put the money into the bank although it's already going through a, a digital network and it will probably have some system being bounced around a few different companies before it arrives with them 
a mistake will be made and somebody will get caught and then once the the authorities have found out how they're doing it they're, they've already got the information they need i mean the way I've, I've i've done some work with police officers in support of veterans and we were chatting and, and we both agreed that as someone selling drugs i only had to get it wrong once the police have only got to get it right once that's how it works you know they, they, they just got to stumble across a lead they get it right bang they've got it and we've got it so we've got to be from my end that's beyond my on my toes all the time i make one mistake and i'm done and i'm done and that's all it is regardless of how you're doing it rich let's talk about then how how did it start getting serious can you tell us any kind of you know what's it like driving a car when you know what's in the boot or shoved in the <laughs> door panel or whatever it is yeah so i think with with um when you're getting involved in that in that world you you, you can choose how you want to operate and you can operate independently as one person or you will go to your supplier you purchase whatever you're buying and you'll distribute that yourself or you can start to sort of think right okay this is getting a bit much one person you start to employ runners so progressively over i would say from about 1999 i always tried to employ runners if it was viable and i could afford to do so and i always have to and 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 this is going to sound really bad because no one in my eyes is expendable or, or disposable. So employing someone who's going to effectively do the dirty work for you, you have to have someone that you trust. And the trouble is, if someone you trust, you generally like them. So why would you want someone that you like doing your crap for you? And it's a really difficult decision to make because you're thinking, I really like this guy. He's my mate, but He's in the crap. He needs some money. He's just lost his job, for example. Rich, got any work? Well, I have, but it's probably not what you're going to want to really do. And I said, well, no, I know what you're doing. And, and she said, well, okay. So you offer them an opportunity to work. I said, not for me, work with me, because my I've always worked with, with guys. I wouldn't have them do anything I haven't done myself, and I wouldn't be prepared to do if I needed to do it. I have done on many occasions. So you kind of expand your business from a one-man band to maybe a couple of you. And then it gets a bit bigger and then you think, well, I, can't, I don't want him doing too much. So I might need someone to, to collect the bulk things before I start messing with it. And I'll, by the way, I don't want to be sat there with my press doing all the hard work. I want someone to do that for me now because I'm don't. i I'm okay. I don't need to take the risk anymore. So you get someone to do that for you. And next thing you know, you've got a network of about four or five runners. One of them bought, one of them, one person just counted the money. One person did the press and I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll get someone to manage it for me. So I don't have to actually manage it anymore. So you get someone to manage all this for you. So really you do expand. And, and there was a time and it doesn't come without its problems. There have been some issues which I've written about in, in the first book, which I won't give too much away because it, it is quite a good read, where when you finally recover from something really bad, you're actually making the money you need to make in order to get out of that life. I always had an exit plan and the exit plan was getting close. Um, you can distance yourself so far away from it that you then become, it becomes a conspiracy. And you're going from being arrested for possession, possession with intent. You're then looking at being arrested for a conspiracy. And, and that's where I was. I was conspiring to sell. So I was communicating with a group of people to distribute this stuff across Bristol parts of the southwest of England, some of it over into Wales, over, over the bridge, you know, and, and it was quite a large network. It was a big network. And I think there were seven or eight people working with me at the time. You combine that with the several people working for this network I was being supplied from, and you add that to the networks of the people that I was supplying to, you've got quite a lot of people involved. Probably talking like 30, 40 people just within fairly close proximity. And That's Rich, can, can we just clarify on that subject? I'm just I'm talking now for the people that don't know about this arena of life, right? Which I'm yeah. guessing is still probably quite. I mean, we talk about it quite sort of openly because it's yeah. you know we understand it. But for people who who are going, oh, what's these druggies? God, yeah. hang, hang them all, hang them all, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just remember, folks, alcohol, worst drug, just is. Um, but 
how many of this network did you meet were raging psychopaths that like None. would would sell poison to children and you know not one person in in my whole experience i've met some really bad people don't get me wrong and you're going to meet bad people in life anyway they just seem that much more when they're not when they're living at, on, on the other side of the law they just seem to be really bad and they are bad people but my my associates and people that i worked with they're all actually decent people some of them even had jobs they just tended to have a little top up um sensible people not non-violent people you get violent people in that industry because you know they're violent you get violent people working with you down in tesco's you just don't know they're violent you know so there are people and there are elements everywhere of, of people which you we you need to avoid but in the, the people i i surrounded myself with i tried to have like-minded people as much as i could people which were some sort of morals i know what we were doing was wrong and morally it was wrong but wouldn't do something where I knew I was going to intentionally hurt someone, but that was being blind about the world I was in at the time. I look back in reflection now, selling drugs, you're going to get people to hurt physically. You didn't have to hurt them physically, but mentally, financially, there's so much damage can be caused. But the people I was with, when we were arrested, and this is this actually came from the police, they said they'd never, and this is going to sound really weird, they never met such a bunch of nice drug dealers, which is really daft, because I don't think is there such a thing. Clearly, they've got people who are decent, decent people just make some really big mistakes in order to survive. And it takes over your life. So, no, not it wasn't a violent network. Um, not once that I ever needed to get involved in anything aggressive or violent. In fact, I choose to my best to actually avoid that if I can, mm. which makes it difficult living in that world if you're can we, someone. Can again, just Rich, for the sake of people at home, again, who are unfamiliar with this, you know, let's remember the biggest next to alcohol the second biggest problem in our country is prescription medication right yeah. we have an opiate epidemic right? yeah these gps scribbling can't write these prescriptions fast enough yeah based on these sociopaths that own these big pharmaceutical companies that that they have no soul mm. they for people that aren't aware when you trade you can trace the the history of some of these companies they have very clever people they pay an awful lot of money to to um work out their marketing strategy campaigns how can they lie to the medical community to get this pill into the market right mm. so you've got one of these strategies was to say that uh, oxycodone which is in incredibly strong opiate right if you're going to be prone to addiction which anyone who's had childhood trauma is yeah that one's going to get you and don't matter if you're taking it for a broken leg or a you know you've had your bloody ears chopped off whatever you you before long you're going to be start to balance in the high more than you are the pain right or or, yeah. or both yeah and these companies pay people to get the GPs to say that this pill is no different to taking an aspirin yeah, or it's about the same strength as a Coke, you know, Coke. And it's, they know what they're doing. They're not, they want the population addicted to these painkiller because they're making a yeah. fortune. Right. So yeah. going back to Rich's point about the nicest group of drug dealers, well, hang on, what's it like when you go in a pharmacy? Are they, are they horrible people? Yeah, they're not kicking the door off, are they? <laughs> you know, they they look quite respectable, don't they? And um, yeah, I'm not I'm not obviously saying here that there isn't a place in life for prescription medication. I certainly need it when my spine was out. That was the worst agony. I yeah. couldn't move, Rich, for six months. I lay in bed peeing in a bucket. It was yeah. awful, you know. I called nine 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 uh, what nine 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 or nine one one three times. I, I was in that much that much pain sometimes right um sorry to di di digress but yeah i just wanted to make that point and uh, we're not i'm not trying to like justify anything here folks it's just yeah. the these the, these are the truths in life that we when we when we just believe our precious bbc we don't get to understand these areas yeah and, if and i think it's pretty valid as well because um 
I've seen two types of two types of people how they run their business involved in, in drug distribution. And you can either run it as a gangster, which is the violent and ruthless way. People get hurt, people are getting kidnapped and everything else. Or we run it as a business and you just try to, to survive off of it. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means that's how you would run the business. You, you don't need to be violent. I, I was asked a question on social media the other day about, do I see many firearms? Um, not once. So I felt the need to carry or use any form of weapon. On, and I've been on so many meetings with people which clearly are carrying some kind of weapon in that room at the time in case it goes tits up. I've never felt the need to. I've, I thought, well, I'm not conducting myself in a way where I'm going to pose a threat. I'm not doing anything which is going to require them to draw a weapon on me. So therefore, why would I need to take, bring a weapon myself? But some people will carry weapons or be violent out of fear or greed. And it's a very greedy industry, is, is cocaine especially. And I think people will get overcome by the greed. With that, they get paranoia as well, because they may be sniffing the profits. They probably aren't, to be fair, because of the, the level they've gotten to. They're not going to get that le to that level by indulging all the time. So then it's generally greed, greed and a, a sense of, of paranoia, and they, they don't want to lose what they've got. And some people do anything to protect that. So, yeah, you, you, and, and that's where the, the problems can come. As you, if you approach a, a new contact with a business mind and that new contact has been dealing with gangsters, they've got a gangster mentality. And you can tell that straight away when, when you meet them, when you see them, and you think, oh, you, you're not really my cup of tea, mate. You know, you're, something not quite right about you. And you pick up on that and you, you decide to sort of walk away from what could be a potentially good contact but you know that that contact will bring unnecessary headaches with that and that's their mentality and how they approach things you know you get the people that shout down the phone at them they're aggressive they're screaming that doesn't change anything you know but the people i was with we all spoke we communicated we talked we all ran our own businesses we just unfortunately were, were kind of doing that as well in order to survive and a lot of the time and this is actually not justifying things at all was in 2008, we had a major recession, 07, 08, we hit the major recession. So financially, a lot of things were going really bad. Um, some people turned to selling drugs during that time in order to keep their businesses alive, keep things afloat. And again, that's not justifying it, but you have businessmen, people which were had worked hard all their life, chose to take this route in order just to just to keep the thing, keep things alive during a recession. And that's some of the people I was involved with. So it was a very um a very difficult time i'm not saying that's myself i was guilty of what i did from day one but i met people who were doing this because they had no choice well there's always a choice but at the time they didn't see a choice and you know to add a bit of balance the other side of the fence you get some raging psychopaths in this world don't you yeah totally yeah. i've i've had to yeah i've been in some really bad positions with people which are absolutely insane totally insane and, and i've there's so many times I should have been dead and I'm not because I can talk <laughs> and if I can't talk I can run it doesn't mean I'm not I can't look after myself but I would rather not have to worry about that I'd rather one not be there two if I can talk my way out of it I will talk my way out of it you know because generally speaking if it goes wrong on a drug deal you're gonna end up with dead bodies you, know, you usually end up with dead bodies and, and that's not something I want to be around I don't want to be involved in that I don't want to see that and but that is the reality, especially now with they say with county lines and young young the younger gangs. These guys are ruthless. I've seen guys coming into prison who are you know younger at the younger end of the scale, like in their early twenties, arriving in an adult prison, and they've got this ruthless mentality and they carry that about them on the wings. So yeah, it's not it's it's not fun when you're mixing a decent you know, moral bunch of drug dealers with, with with ones which aren't quite you know they'll they'll rob you for anything they can. Yeah, we should also acknowledge, like, back there in Colombia, you've got nutcases like Pablo Escobar, haven't you? Just, yeah. just utter psychopath, yeah. complete egomaniac, whatever cloud he was on, just anyone he wanted to blow up and intimidate, you know, massive loss of life. Again, yeah. I think the educated observer would say, drug laws, let's look at the drug, you know, because market demand, capitalist yeah. society... People are going to sell stuff if they can make money. And yeah. if the chances of getting caught are, 
you know, and even if the chances of getting caught are sometimes pretty shit, you know, like you are going to, yeah, we always look to the positive as humans, don't we? Think that won't happen to us. You know, yeah, you be optimistic, don't you? And um, you may calculate risks, don't you? you? You calculate your risk. You look at what you're going to do. Um, there's always going to be a variable in there which you can't quite be sure of, and that's usually the other person. But you calculate all of your risks throughout the, the particular process you're going to take, whether it be from taking what you're going to deliver from from point A to point B. You look at the person taking it for you, look at the vehicle they're driving, look at their, their comms. Are they, do they smoke pot? Are they going to have a sneaky joint on the way down there and elevate their risks? Are they a drinker? Are they going to stop and dive into the bag on the route? You have to calculate all of these things before they've even left and decide whether to actually employ that person. What happens on the other end of that deal is you have to think, right, where's the meeting place going to be? Who are they going to see? What's the person like they're going to see? Is the person they're like going to actually be there on time? We're going to be waiting for half an hour to lay by. There's so many things you have to weigh in and consider on every little drop. And if you're doing three or four of these at once, as a, the person conspiring, you're planning all of this and calculating all of these risks because any one of these people get it wrong, that comes back up the chain, lands on your head, then you're getting knocked down for conspiracy to supply cocaine, which is what happened. <laughs> Rich, let's just talk about a few things. I've just ma made a couple of notes here. So in the car then, yeah. it, 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 was there, is there a, like a favoured place that dealers put their stash? Is there somewhere that... Uh... Yeah, well, do you know what? I was actually quite... I used to love Christmas. Because we, I would always wrap everything in Christmas presents and gift wrap it and put it in a, 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 a plausible bag and have it on the back seat. If it's in there and it's out of sight, out of mind, that's good enough for me. It's, you're not talking a couple of grams, you're talking a couple of kilos. You're not going to hide it under anywhere. If your guys are getting pulled they're gonna and, and they're pulling you for a reason, they're going to find it. They already know it's in the car. Why make it? Why draw it out? <laughs> it's going to get found anyway. If you're going to go to the effort of secreting it about the car within the boot linings and everything else, at some point on the other end of that journey, you have to then get it back out again and, and sell it. So, And if someone's done multiple drops, if they're the guys I had doing the running, they might, I would never give them more than two or three drops each because one, you don't want them having on the phone too much. And secondly, if you're having too much on them, and thirdly, you're elevating the risk of them getting caught by doing more than those drops anyway. So why not spread it out a little bit? Mm. So now, generally speaking, I just say, long as you're happy with it and it's wrapped up. And if it wasn't Christmas, I'd put it in birthday wrapping paper anyway. It'd always be gift wrapped um, and vacuum sealed as well. In case that would be ditched into a river or under a bush or they weren't happy, it would be, it'd be weatherproofed. Might be in bright wrapping paper, but it'd be red and it'd be weatherproofed. So I always kind of had that, you know, that mentality of always preparing for the unexpected, preparing to get caught. And so the guys would just be quite happy to say they'll have a carrier bag on the back seat or on the front seat full of these little gift wrappings. And it'd have like a, it wouldn't have a name on the front, it might have a little star or one or two. Okay, it, it might, it, they, they would know what's for what person. And if they get pulled, they get pulled and let's hope they can talk the way out of it. But they shouldn't give themselves any reason to be pulled. Shouldn't be speeding, shouldn't be, shouldn't be drinking, shouldn't be doing anything illegal. But you get some, I had one guy, a very close friend, um, suffer with a temper. And he was known for road, <laughs> he was known for jumping out of the car and having a go at people every now and again. And did that with me in the car and I had 30 grand in the footwell by my feet. <laughs> Just leapt out of the car and started screaming at some guy. And I'm thinking, would you please get back in the car? Mate? I've got a lot of money on me. Get back in the car, let's move on. And he sort of came back and just grunted a little bit. <laughs> we drove on. So that's when I was there. God knows what he was like when I wasn't. Good friend, though. So no, I do apologise, mate, if you're listening. He knows who he is. <laughs> yeah. Rich, how does it work then? Because obviously you're passing on down the line yeah. a product at a certain quality. Yeah. But when you go and buy it, and sometimes needs must, if you need that kilo, you need, you, you know, but... Well, two questions I should ask you. First off, how did you test it? Is it like in the Miami Vice, you know, <laughs> where they do all that 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 stuff? It can be. Um, yeah, so, so it's you have to try and weigh up 
your capacity in that particular now I was very good at going into I call it the lion's den going into a first contact meeting with people and and trying something not try it but the ways I would test and am I allowed to say this I mean I don't want to give people any clues but one of the ways I would do would be to take a peek between my fingers and rub it and it would give a certain indication to me if certain things happened or didn't happen I would know that it was good or bad that would be a good enough indication for me to say yes this is what you're saying it is I'm happy to take this based on on what I've seen so far however if it's not when we when we test it properly it's coming straight back to you this will be done on credit so they just wouldn't get paid they get the stuff back and as okay. it comes back in the same way that they've they've left it then that's not a problem um other times if i'm bringing if i'm bringing something to someone and they would want to test it and i, and I would respect the fact that the, if they're spending cash on it and they're paying up front they want to actually physically test it, but they may well stick a bit up bit of their nose which isn't ideal because then You've got to sit and wait for them to get off their tits and you just sat there, I just want to get paid, mate, so I can get out of this house. I don't really like it in here. Or they may do a process where they convert it into crack to test the purity, not because they want crack, but because that's their indication of how much they they can produce from a given measure. And I'm being very careful how I say this, how much they can produce from a given measure will will tell them the, the more or less the priority and percentage. That's a process which is not ideal but it does give them a, a pretty good answer of how good it is so that's really something that some people will do if they're paying cash and it's not it's not nice you you see a very dirty process and you see something which is the other end of the spectrum of where i where i choose to be and but you know what the good and this is the thing what they would do with what they produce that crack they throw it away they chuck it straight down the sink and that made, made me think, right, at least they're not doing it for that. That's the way of testing. And I admit, I have had to test things myself. I've done this. And same thing, I just take that that rock and I just chuck it away. I'm not interested. I don't I don't know what it stands for. I don't like what it does. And I don't like actually having it because it's that is pushing something a little bit too far. And that might sound weird coming from someone that sells, sold cocaine. But crack is, is a whole different kettle of fish. That's something that I, I would choose not to have any involvement with. And I didn't like having it around me, even if it was less than a gram, it would still get thrown in the sink or washed down the toilet because it, it represented something I didn't like. So before your obviously before your arrest, yeah, your arrests plural, because um, we haven't got that far yet. What what were like the big scares? You know, did you ever get pulled on the motorway or something and think, oh Jesus Christ, this is it? I had um. There was numerous occasions, and I think the closest I ever had, and this was really, I was doing some work with the Colombians over in Spain, and I was paying a debt off. I won't go into it in too much depth because this is going to be something in one of the books, but basically I was transiting a couple of kilos of coke from Spain up through France, and I had a meeting point near the border sorry near near the coast near calais to offload this coat to somebody that was going to take it over the water for me and this is a particular time i had to be there for now i've run into a slight problem in in spain by talking about trying to stash the stuff i stick it in a line under the boot and it was dark it was five in the morning it was dark it was cold so i just sort of like did the best to ram these couple of kilos into the boot line of this car and i thought well, that will do it's in there it's out of sight it's out of mind this has set me back about half hour, 40 minutes from my meeting point. So I had to think, right, I've got to get a move on here. So I had to go through various checkpoints through the um, through the border control between Spain over by Bilbao, over on the west side, up through France towards Paris. And I had no choice, but I had to put my foot down. Um, now, prior to this, the guy that I, the, the firm that I was working with, I had no money, I was skint, I was paying a debt off. He said, there's some money for expenses. They give me a 500 euro note. You don't see them around very often. And they're just, they're, they're questionable to have in possession anyway. So that's all I had on me. So I was tanking it up through France and I come over the rise of this hill and I saw a police car doing a, it was radar. I thought, crap, I've just been pulled. So I sort of slowed down, eased off. He pulled out behind me. I thought, great, I'm in trouble here pulls me over and he looks in there and he says, I'm trying to speak my best French. He says, oh, you were going too fast, blah, blah, blah. 
He said, you were uh, 90 euros to pay for the speed in front. I thought, that's fine. I thought, oh, well, I got this is 500 euro note. So Paul actually looked at me and he went, no, you come with us. So they escorted me off of the motorway to these, got these gates on the side of the, the, the French motorway where you, you would access the, um, sorry, come off the motorway and onto the, the, the normal roads. They escorted me off for this and it took me and they were taking me into the police station. I thought, I'm in trouble here. And I thought, I've got two keys in the back. They've seen this 500 euro on there. Clearly this is um, a, a flag, a red flag for them. So that indicated a space for me to pull in. So I thought, it's just some kind of search in stop space. And he walked over to me and he said, do you have a cash card? I said, yeah, but it's not working. There's no money. He, was, he looked at me again. He said, you follow us. And they escorted me back out of the police station, back onto the motorway to the nearest garage, made me buy some fuel. And I went into the garage, poured out the 500. She goes, not taking it. I said, please just take the money. I think I've gotten away with this. And I said, explain to her that I've been pulled by the police. Um, I didn't tell her I had drugs in the boot. I told her I've been pulled by the police. I need to pay a fine. So she eventually got her manager out, took the money, had the change, paid the police. Au revoir, monsieur. And they went on their way. So yeah, I was sat in a French police station with two kilos, two kilos of coke in the boot. Um, but I remained calm all the time. I thought there's no point crying about this. I can't do anything about it. I'm not going to run, so I can't outrun them. Where am I going to go? Let's just ride it out and see what happens. But that was probably one of the one of the closest I've had. I have had the police in my house searching prior to my arrest in 2009, where there was nothing in there. It was, it was associated with somebody I used to supply to. And I think there was something going on. But they came, they didn't arrest me. They didn't charge me. They just wanted to search the house associated with another person which I think that was back in the 09. And this kind of didn't go anywhere because by at this point, I think the investigation into me had already started from soccer from Avon and Somerset. So I think when they, they could have probably investigated further, but I think they probably said, look, back off from this one, guys, we've got something a bit bigger going on with this. So that didn't really come to anything. And then that led up to my, um, my whole organization getting taken down the back in the 2010 which was something else yeah so was that a surveillance opera you know a big intelligence operation that was being yeah. done with you guys there were we believe it well believe it, i know there are informants involved um more than one i think there, there's it's difficult to say and there's a lot of paranoia involved but i think you've got to read between the lines sometimes there was a surveillance operation going on they were watching i think not so much watching me but they were certainly keeping tabs on me for a while prior to the first arrest which is the end of uh, the end of october 2010 you get signs and indication being quite surveillance savvy sometimes when you're speaking on your phone on your burner as, as as you mentioned when you ring someone who's involved in that conspiracy because bear in mind this phone will only have the numbers in it for people that you are dealing with if you like you sometimes get a bit of feedback or an echo or think it doesn't sound right so i'll say look i'll call you back in a sec it doesn't matter call him back is you telling the person that's listening to you that you know they're listening to you or you've got an idea. So the weird thing is you call back and that echo's gone and that feedback is gone. I think that sounds better, but I don't like this. You change your phones. Um, so you do get kind of signs that you that you may be being watched periodically over a period of time. But when the first arrest was taken down, that was, the, I think, October the 28th or 27th, 2010. Close friend of mine, the guy that suffered road rage, funny enough, he was nicked with, a, with about one and a quarter kilos uh, in the car. Uh, I think he resisted arrest a little bit, but he would have done because he's that's how he is. Um, and for me, being slightly, I suppose I was trying to be slightly ignorant, I was kind of hoping, gutted he'd been arrested because now I've got 40 odd grand bill to pay and I've just lost a really good friend. But second, I was kind of hoping it's because it was something linked with his road rage. He'd been something that caught up with him. So I'm thinking, is it, has he been nicked or not? And I, I, is it to do with me? Is it to do with the conspiracy? The fact is irrelevant. The fact that he'd been caught with drugs was enough then for me to think, well, I've got to shut down. So what the police would do is I'll keep, they'll, would there be in a, and this is how we know this is a, um, an informant involved, that person will manipulate the situation to try and get you to keep, keep selling. Because I'd shut down. I thought, no, that's it. I'm done. I'm finished. This, this is, it's on top. We're, we're going to get arrested. I need to do damage limitation now. 
but this guy kept saying, oh, I'll just do, I've got a friend who will do something for you. Just, you know, just do, just do a little bit. I said, no, I don't want to. I've had enough. I'm finished. I'm done. This is the guy that was managing for me. But another month went by and, and the guy said, look, you know, I don't need somebody I know needs something. Can you, can you sort out? And I thought, oh, all right. So I made a couple of phone calls, sent this guy down to the south to, to collect something. And uh, he got arrested. So that was the first thing I'd done since the previous arrest. The next guy got nicked straight away. I thought, well, that's weird. Um, seems to me like it's definitely on top now just to do two, to get two arrests in, in over a space of a month, literally a month apart, and then get nicked straight away. So clearly he's being watched. Right, that's it. I'm definitely done. So another month goes by and it's New Year's Eve. Um, a chap that was always, that I used to supply to said, oh, um, so like it's New Year's Eve, mate. I need to get some sort of. I said, mate, I am out of it. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm already in trouble. I don't want to be in any more trouble. He said, look, can you put me into someone? I said, look, I'll give you a number, but I'm nothing to do with it. So I gave this chap, this gave me each other's numbers basically. So he wanted an ounce of cocaine. I thought, let them get on with it. I'm, I've already involved myself now by giving them the numbers. That is conspiracy alone. So someone thinks that just giving a number is okay. It's not. You've already conspired. If, it, if you weren't there, that deal would never happen. So you have to, have, to, have to look at how a conspiracy works. So I've given the number. Now, New Year's Eve is midday. Get a phone call from the chap that wants the goods and I can't get all of your mate. Ring him. I'm trying, so I'll ring him for you. So I rang him. So yeah, I said, can you ring him? He's trying to get older. This, this is all of a sudden that link, that circle has just been sealed by these phone calls. They met up. He drove away. He got arrested. I thought, well, it's pretty clear to me what's going on. So three people got arrested in three deals over three months. And that is clearly definitive proof that I was clearly being watched and things were going on. So time goes by, uh, April 2011. Uh, I was at work. I was running a business at the time. This is my exit strategy. I'd already kind of almost made it, but that's probably another story. And three or four unmarked focuses pull up outside and I thought this what was is the different. business mate I used to work in motorsport it was called launch motorsport so I used to develop cars for competition use I used to race and this is part of the ill-gotten gains I think of me living that lavish lifestyle of trying to move out of selling drugs into opening a garage and I actually got the garage opened it was there and I finally made it I fell at the last hurdle but that's yeah, that's something else. You know, it was it was difficult because of the recession. It was oh, I mean, I opened the garage the first of October twenty ten. The investigation started the twenty third of September that same year. So literally, I'd open the garage a week after they'd started watching me. It's inevitable. It was going to happen. So you should just have with... you should have built yourself a General Lee. <laughs> yeah, I know. They always escape. Yeah. They always escape from the cops and got out of jail. I know, I know. I should have built, should have built, should have got back in the tank again. I'd have been all right. Um, yeah. So I think it was around about the fourteenth of April, fourteenth uh, of April, twenty eleven. They these cars turned up, and I thought, well, that's it then. You know. So I walked out to say good morning. Rich Jones, yeah, right. We're arresting you for conspiracy to blow cocaine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So right, okay. Anything you say, or <laughs> what can I say? Didn't say anything. Went back, was interviewed. I was released on bail, which was surprising. Did you get a brief? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. And and do you know what? This is this is the really crazy thing about it. I I didn't know what to do because I actually really like the police. I got so much time for the police. I have got. I've never at any point seen the police as the enemy. I just seen them as the other side of the coin, doing doing a job which they have to do. And with my dad's background, I got huge respect for the police. Mm. And I felt if I'm going to be going no comment, I feel like I'm being a right idiot here. I don't want to make I don't want to make their job hard. And that sounds really daft because I got that much time for them. But my brief said, "Look, what do you want to do?" I said, "Well, I got I got nothing to hide. I'm trying to play the innocent man." I said, "Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, but I'm, I'm clever enough not to drop anyone in the crap. But you, you are going to get yourself in trouble by just purely commenting and speaking because they are going to find a way to reel you in." which is what they have to do during the interview process to reel you in and get you to um, either look stupid or say something which you didn't want to say or say something which conflicts something you said earlier. And that's just the process that you go through. And, and although I thought I did a pretty good job on the interview and I, I actually thoroughly enjoyed it, I quite like being interrogated. 
because that's how it felt. And I quite like the thought, oh, this is, this is great. This is, this is, but it's real. It's not a game. It's real. And I, I didn't really take it. If I'd have really thought about it, I'd have just gone no comment all the way through. Uh, but I was released on bail, which was, which was great. Until then I got to start explaining to my family and everyone else. And the, why were the police around the garage and everything else? So then you're already on this decline. Things are already starting to go very wrong. And then I get arrested again in July by, sorry, I was arrested by Evan and Somerset Soccer, Serious Organised Crime, now known as the NCA, the National Crime Agency. So they're, they're as high up as they get. Uh, I was arrested by Soccer then from Gloucestershire, who were doing an investigation with Thames Valley. And they were associated with my suppliers. So they're taking down the whole network now of, of, of myself and, and all my runners and, and not so much anyone I'm supplying to because they're not really interested in them. I certainly want the guys above. So then all my co-defendants get arrested with Gloucestershire. So I was arrested twice for conspiracy. And then the second one, they actually remanded me in prison. They reminded me a week later, I went back to sign bail a week later. They said, right, we're, we're keeping you in now. And I thought, oh, great. So that was my first time of going into prison. That was the, when was that? The 4th, 5th of August. Yeah, 5th did, of August, 2011. Did that bear any similarities with when you joined the mob? Was, is yeah, that... yeah, scary really, because you just automatically default to military mind and the, the, the thing, right, I've got to learn a lot now. I need to adapt to, to however, whatever's, whatever's through these doors is going to be unfamiliar. And whoever are through these doors, I don't know who they are. They could be a threat. Are they friend? Are they foe? You're assessing everyone's friend or foe, friend or foe. Most of these people are actually quite benign and they're not really a problem. They're just going about their daily business. You rough, But you, you do go into automatic default and all of your all the trainers which has been 20 years before however long ago it all just suddenly comes flooding back to you and then so you survive you, you adapt to survive in there and then you go in there and you think i think my first thought was um i was in a prison cell all day in gloucester with a chap who'd been on the run for god knows how long and he he wasn't too healthy he smelled bad um he was a heavy smoker he was a heavy drinker and we got chatting and, and he said, look, do you want to stay on induction with me? Because this, I thought this guy's clearly been inside a lot. He knows how it works. He knows what it's like. So I thought, well, better the devil you know. He's not a bad guy. He's, he's just some guy that's been on the street. So I thought, well, I'll go on induction with him because it will make sense. So we arrived on the wing at about seven o'clock on the night in Gloucester Prison, which is now closed. I thought, wow, this is great. It's like, just like on the telly, but it was really quiet. And uh, you go into your cell, and the first thing that struck me was the fact there was a TV in there. Oh, we've got a telly, that's dead handy. I thought it was going to be like a room with nothing, like a bucket in the corner. Oh, we've got a toilet. Oh, that's fantastic. And I thought, oh, wait, this is, I've been in worse. This is going to be great. It's going to be fine. So I dived on the bottom bunk, and then I'm led down, and the toilet is right next to my head, literally a foot away. Now, he's this guy, I won't say his name, nice enough guy, heavy smoker, all he does all night is he's smoking and drinking prison tea. And the first thing that struck me, which is probably a problem, is he was being given his medication through the hatch in the door because he can't open the door, they just deliver it through the hatch. And he's on, he's coming off of alcohol, so I think he's given something called Librium, I think. Yeah. That, is that correct? So he's cheeked it, which means he's put it in his cheek and he's, he's done the, that to make sure that he's taken it, but he hasn't, it's in there. And they've gone, and he's sat outside, and he starts crushing his pill up. I thought, what's he doing? I said, what are you doing, mate? So I'm going to do it this way. I'll get, in, I'll get a hit off it then. I thought, oh, okay. And that, that, that's the kind of thing. I mean, he's there sniff, sniffing this pill or whatever format it came in off the side. I thought, great. So now I'm letting this bed all through all that. All I remember is him smoking, drinking tea, and taking a pee next to my head, and it stinks. Because it's and I and I could almost taste it. It's that close, and that's my first night in prison was being surrounded because I'm a non-smoker, being surrounded by smoke and this guy weeing next to my head all the time, and then just being that. And he didn't sleep. He just seemed to sort of phase in and out of smoking and drinking his tea and having a wee, and it was all night. And I thought, gosh, so we're put into the same cell. Three weeks I spent with him. He was a, he was a nice lad, but not my cup of tea. I was given bail, luckily. Uh, 
fortunately for me, although not for the community, there were the riots kicked off in all the cities in August 2009, uh, 2011, sorry. I remember it was kicking off around London in various areas. My brief said, we'll post bail, wait until they finish the rest of people from these riots because they're going to need the room in the prisons and we'll get you, we'll get you out. I thought, okay, so on the 9th of September, I was, got, I was given bail, I was released. And then I was put on a tag for nine months, waiting for the trial to come through. And I ran trial then for two counts of conspiracy, um, which was me linking. I was like the link between these two organizations, mine and my suppliers. And I think that they needed the two arrests to have enough evidence to really to, to put the nail in the coffin for me, if you like, because there was never any drugs or money found on me. They could kind of say lifestyle, but because of the recession, it was difficult. All of my accounts were completely wrote off, completely withdrawn, because it was tough times. Um, everything I had was played into the business at the time to try and to, to make a break. So financially, I had nothing. I had nothing left. I was totally broke. So they couldn't even do me a lifestyle, which, which was fortunate. So I was found guilty on one count and not guilty on another. And that was probably one of the most difficult three or four days while the jury are out deliberating and deciding whether you're guilty or not is like that's a tough one especially when you get the to get the tunnel in the court saying can ever all people in the case of so and so please report back to court number five and you think here we go this is it and you're standing there and it was kind of like a you know it's up and down because there were i think five of us sat in the dock at the time there's there was that many of us in the two trials but they, they tried me on the one trial with two counts, it was complicated. But basically, I stood in the in the dock with my co-defendants to my right, two on my left, two on my right. And uh, they said, count one, how do you find so-and-so guilty? Yep, guilty. And you see in the public gallery, his his whole world fall apart, his family, his, his girlfriend, his wife, people collapsing, people crying, people screaming. Uh, then the other co-defendant from Serbia, who was the, the far end of the supply chain, guilty. Um, and then me, uh, Kang, were not guilty. I thought, God, I'm not a religious man. But as I said, oh, thank God for that. Two guys to my left got not guilty. And I thought, wow, I've got, I've, I've done it. I've got away with this. And I thought, oh, no, I've got count two yet. So how did you find Mr. Jones on count two? Guilty. And it was like, I looked across to my wife and her face. You could just see her whole world just fall apart. And you think that there is the punishment alone. And it, that, that, I think the devastation there is really bad. I'm just going to bomb us some stuff here, Rich. So yeah. that moment when you've got to go back in them doors, yeah. stand in the dock, and it's like, oh, my God, I, I could have it. My fucking ass handed to me here. Yeah. Like, had you been able to go back in a time machine and not do any of that stuff, would you have not done it? I. <laughs> it's a really good question because um, at that point there and then, right there, at that point, within a heartbeat, I'd have gone back and I'd have, I'd have wished I hadn't come out of the army. I would have wished anything yeah. to not see my wife's face out, to see her world just suddenly get shattered. I'd have done anything. Anything would have changed that. I'd have, I'd have done it in a heartbeat. Ask the question now with going through what I've been through and the transition and the chance to rethink about everything. No, I have to. I, I had to experience all those bad things to be able to do what i'm doing now but back then yeah in a heartbeat i would have i would have done anything i could to change everything you know yeah. i said let's just forget yeah. everything and wipe the slate clean yeah so we're we're it's the old hindsight isn't it, it yeah and you get the double high at the, the hindsight at the time is god i wish i had done this shit wish yeah. i'd just gone and got a fucking job right yeah but that, but us looking back now is hang on we we can't be living in regret we put it down to experience yeah we we try to do the best we can for society and our community and we try to be you know a good good person isn't it really as, 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 yeah. much, as, think, as much as we you, can you, be <laughs> I mean, you need to own your mistakes don't you you need to own it a little bit and work from it and if i think if you can't don't get me wrong, there are some offences which you, you just simply cannot own. You know, some things that people do with, which are always going to be with them forever and they could never, never use that offence to, to better anyone's life. But I'm fortunate that my offence, I can, and it's not pride, I'm not proud of it, but I can actually say, look, this is what I've done. 
I've made some really bad mistakes. I've never actually physically hurt anyone intentionally, although people have been hurt. People have been, there is damage along the way, but I'm using this now to do my best to try and help other people, other veterans who, who might think, you know, if I could see, if I could sit back now and look at a version of myself 25 years ago, I'd sit back and think, you are in for it, mate. <laughs> you are really in trouble. He yeah. just doesn't see it. But let, let's also just for the sake of balance and not deluding ourselves as we do as a society all the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's a two way door, mate. Then people that bought off you didn't give a fuck whether you were going to get arrested the next day and lo lo uh, lose. Interesting point. Yeah. They, they, and I'm not blaming them. I'm saying mm -hmm. that we make choices in life. You know, yeah. we make them, we have to live by them. It, it's just the way yeah. it is. You weren't twisting anyone's arm. You no. weren't down at the school playground handing out freebie samples to get people. You know, you know. No, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to excuse anything. I'm just saying it how it is, right? Yeah, and I think it's an interesting point because you can. A lot of it, people think about self-preservation, don't they? They're, most people, most of the time, are going to worry about themselves and how how things affect them. A lot of veterans tend to sort of be outward thinking and care more about the people around them. And certainly, your your brothers and your sisters, you think more about how they're going to be and you're right if, if if there was an arrest above me in the chain I was quite happy to take supply from them they've been nicked that affects me but part of me is thinking well that's it that's done we all knew what we signed up for when we did this when we made these deals we know what we're signing up for no one's being forced or coerced into anything this is all free will it doesn't make it right it just means that people go in there with their eyes wide open. And if their eyes aren't wide open, they need to open their eyes and look around a little bit. Because if people are going to step into any form of the arena with, with not just drugs, any criminality, there's going to be damage. It's illegal for a reason, you know, because there, there is going to be cost. There's going to be damage. There's going to be pain. There's going to be victims. There's always a victim of anything, anything which has a negative consequence. There's going to be a victim somewhere along the line. And if, I, if someone said to me, do you think about your victims? And... When you're supplying that much, you don't directly see a victim as such. It's not like I'm going around someone's house and handing them a, a bag of heroin and seeing them decline and seeing them getting kicked out of the house, seeing them lose everything they own. You, you're so detached from that that you don't see it. But if someone said, how many victims are there in mind? It's, it's countless, countless victims. Thousands and thousands of people have suffered in some way or other. It could be really insignificant. They might, they might have just missed... They might not be able to afford to buy their favourite, you know, favourite food because they spent a little bit too much money on on coke the weekend before, and they just can't quite afford to buy something the following week. They haven't gone hungry, but that there is a victim. Yeah, there, the, Rich, I'm, I'm not trying. I'm, well, maybe I am trying to play devil's advocate, and I'm also trying to just shed light on this situation so we can start dealing with it as adults. Yeah. Right. As a society, I mean as opposed to this bloody childish name calling and and superstition and and etc 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 i'm just gonna say no those people are victims probably a childhood trauma right yeah yeah they are victims to other people that, that, that i'm not defending drug if anyone's listening and thinks that then you you you, you really misunderstand me right I'm trying to make the world better for all of us, right? And I have that insight because I've been on these sides of the fence, right? What, what I'm saying is, you know, you've got 10 people in a room on a Saturday night. They've all had a Bacardi and Coke. They're waiting for their guy to come, you know? <laughs> come on, who hasn't been there? Everyone's chucking in the 50s, a ton, mm. two. You, you, there's like a thousand pound in your hands. Yeah. You Is he cool, Jet? Is he, you know? Yeah. dealers that shut the fuck up if you call me again <laughs> i ain't coming if i say i'm coming i'm coming all right yep you sorry mate sorry mate right yeah. and he comes oh wait mate want a drink want a drink yeah do you want do you want one it, it's yeah is anyone yeah. fucking forcing those people no. no 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 what it is is for various different reasons sometimes just like the example i gave this is social you've you've got together with your mates on saturday night you know Instead of downing a bottle of JD and puking over the, you know, the girl sat next to you, you just want to have a bit of sniff. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's what it is, right? 
I think that's a really good point because the yeah. amount of phone traffic you get at a certain level, when you're certainly selling the, the, the grams to the people, and this wasn't oh, something I was privy to, but the amount of phone traffic going incoming calls to someone who's selling compared to outgoing calls is phenomenal. You're right. Are you there? Where are you going to be long? Because everyone's waiting. There. And something you're mindful of at a certain point is supply. I've got to make sure this gets to this point here to be there, to be there, to be ready for the weekend. So we start our week of supply on like a Tuesday to ensure that it gets to where it needs to go ready for that weekend. So you're right that the traffic is usually incoming. They're saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Yeah. The, and what I was getting to, Rich, is like you're looking at a guy. Anyone's watching this now. I, my, Anyone around would say I lost everything. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I actually gained the world through my experiences and I'm, I wouldn't change them for a thing. Right. I haven't made any mistakes in my life, Rich, because mm -hmm. if you meet my son, yeah. he's the most perfect little boy in the world. I'm, yeah. I'm, I am the luckiest man alive to have the best son in the world. Right. Yeah. If I hadn't done all this stuff, I wouldn't have him. And no, yeah. you know, no one takes him away from me, right? Yeah. And I haven't even begun to tell you about my partner, right? I'm a yeah. very lucky man. The choices yeah. I made in my life led me. I'm not saying other people do what I did. Yeah. They led me here. And if people think I'm gonna fucking apologize, you go yeah. fuck yourselves, you know. You you're, yeah. you're delude you live in the delusion called the matrix, right? Yeah. All I'm saying is is I, I was mentally unwell. I I was pissing off the Hong Kong triads. Yeah. I was doing silly stuff like handstands on skyscrapers, right? Uh, my parents were faced with the, you know, the medical profession said to my dad, Steve, you, you need to put him in a mental health unit and yeah, he, he probably won't ever come out, right? That's how ill I was, right? Yeah. My point is no one ever forced me into that situation right. rich no drug dealer I, I needed that outlet for this trauma that was driving my behavior the trauma right no yeah. one forced me to do you know if if you'd said no chris you're looking a bit ropey mate you're looking a bit uh, all right rich yeah i'd have probably told you some fable right i want mm. a liar per se yeah. but i wouldn't have wanted you to know actually how ill i was because i i want you to think i'm cool right I'd have yeah. just gone to the next guy and told them whatever story they wanted yeah. to hear to be able, you know, and um, like, you know, it, I, again, I'm, I'm not trying to do defend anything. I'm just trying to add clarity to it all. And, you yeah. know, I, I, I see people because of our society, we have to like apologize for our beer. And it's like, hang yeah. on the whole, we should be looking at why, do people suffer trauma? What is it that's driving that trauma? Why are parents, for example, putting that trauma on kids? Look at the situation at the moment. Let's not say any names. How many kids are at home now being abused, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the situation. How many wives are being battered? How many yeah. husbands are being battered, right? Yeah. Mental health is taking yeah. them How much it? trauma is going to come out of this? And then when that little kitty gets to 15 and then has a sniff problem because they feel like not the beaten, abused little kid anymore. Yeah. Then you put them in prison or, yeah. or you get the person that sold them that and, and blame it all on them. We are deluded in this society. Yeah. We are utterly deluded. We don't understand that a substance is just a plant that grows in the dirt. That's all it is. Right. OK, it can be process for a factory into some what but it's an inanimate object it's as stupid as that pen right yeah. the notion that that can give me a mental health problem is just yeah. beyond stupid right yeah. the driver is our life experience most often childhood not always you know but there is something missing in your life in it if you have to be waiting for that dealer on a friday night going come on guys chip mm -hmm. in is he here yet you know you know we need to yeah. answer that question Sorry, yeah. folks, going on, going off on one there, but I just don't. Uh, it's absolutely you know, wrong. Yeah. I'm, I'm not afraid to tell the truth, mate, because people can think what they want want of me, and they very often do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's cool because you know we're all going to die. Who gives a fuck, right? That's it. Um, that's but at least when I die, I was honest, and I want I wasn't, yeah. a, you know, I wasn't a coward. Um, yeah. Well, pro <laughs> probably am at some things, but. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, bloody fascinating, Rich. You know, I think you probably cleared up a lot of stuff. Well, between us, um, yeah. that hopefully can help. Um, th th there's, there's, there's all we could talk again and again. Let Let's finish off in a set by talking about your actual prison time. You yeah. made me laugh when you say induction. Anyone yeah. who's ever joined the Marines knows well before. I'll tell you the story. When we joined, it was induction, right? You're yeah. in there for a brainwashing, right? That's that's what it's the military mass, is, right? Mass grooming, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great brainwashing in the Marines. It's fucking brilliant. You know, yeah. there is aspects of it that most of the time it, 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 it it's brilliant. You can't defend everything, right? <laughs> but but it's called induction for a reason. No, now it's called foundation. <laughs> oh, really? That's very political, isn't it? <laughs> but I'll, I'll be honest. That's a beautiful word as well because. Off yeah. the back of my time in the forces, it was a foundation yeah. that I've launched. You know, I've I've taken the good from it. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. we'll come back to to your prison time because um, that's just you know, I've narrowly avoided prison. The most I've done is nights in the cells. Yeah, again, that's enough to make you go, oh, Christ, what the? Why did I do yeah. that? You know. Yeah. Um. um but yes, yeah, so far, mate, just want to thank you for, you know, being brave yeah, enough to tell your story, um, being a beacon of, of light. Also, we must talk about um, your involvement in, in charity. Yeah. Um, before we go. And of course, we're going to shout your book. So um, one sec. Yeah. So, Rich, we were um, saying about the what's it like to be military and go in jail. Yeah. Um, did you have any kind of, so how many years did you get and how many years did you serve? So I sent us to 15 years, which Whoa. was because I was expecting about 10 or 11, which is still a lot, but I was sent to 15 years. So the way that it works then, and it is slightly different now, depending on certain factors, but you'll do half of that in custody. So seven and a half years, but what they will do, they will take away any time on remand and any time on tag, if, you, if you're curfew to more than 12 hours in your house, they'll take off your sentence. So that's four and a half months of my sentence was reduced because I was on bail, because I was, couldn't go out of the house for the, that, that duration. So effectively I did just over seven years in prison in one hit. I'm still on license now till 2027. Right, was that... Um where were you like exeter or bristol or somewhere uh, so yeah so um initially in gloucester as i said um for those five weeks on remand and then when i was found guilty on may the 17th 2012 remanded into bristol which was an experience it's not a night it was worse now it wasn't great then it's old victorian prison even the new wings are rough you know the and my experience on there, and I'll, I'll go into that now if you want, is you first arrive and, and you're in a holding cell with everyone who's just come from court. And these guys may have been out for the day in a court appearance, so they've, they've already come out of the prison, so they're just flowing through the system, or you'd be getting newly inducted into the prison. So you're there with people that with other with my co-defendants and other people, and you're you're weighing each other up automatically because you're you don't know who these people are, what they're in for, what have they done, and they're thinking the same thing about you. So automatically, I'm just, just veterans do it. You're just assessing people. There's no point assessing the exits and ways in and ways out because you ain't getting out. So that kind of gets taken away from you. So you've got to do is focus on the people, the individuals, and listen to the noises next door in the in the in the admissions or the reception department where they where they process you into the prison. That's what you wait for. So you're already automatically i think your first bit even before that when you get put into the the, the old goa me or the g4s or circo buses uh the sweat boxes we call them the little tiny cubicle not much bigger than being stuck inside of a big fridge to be fair that's for me was comfortable because i'm a tank gunner i'm fine with that i'm used to looking out of a little window i'm comfortable with this not a problem but other people are already banging their doors already kicking or kicking off so you're hearing the chaos of what's going to be of, of what your life's going to be like for the next you're not thinking seven years, you're not thinking 15, you're just thinking it's a long time. Um, so you go into the, in, you get called through to the reception and you sit in front of a member of staff 
people call them, I call them staff because they're people that are doing a job. A lot of them are ex-forces. Treat them with respect and they will definitely treat you with respect. You know, yeah, you give me, you, you, yeah, Jones, come here. It's great. Just like being back in the army and love it. Perfect. Some guys take a section. Oh, I'm not Jones. I'm called so-and-so. You know, that's your name. They're speaking to you. Just do as you're told. Um, and they'll identify various things about your healthcare needs and any mental health, any physical problems, any allergies, all these sort of things, wherever you come from. Did you serve in the armed forces? Yes, I did. And you, you declare that. I declared it because one of I thought, well, why not? Uh, secondly, it's going to have to give me a break at some point. Surely that must be, that must count for something somewhere in my life. You know, and then thirdly, is it, it have they served in the forces? Are you are you going to get a little bit of a touch on the wing? You know, you, you you're weighing up this this survival of what can I do? How am I going to get through this? What's in front of me? Because I just don't know. First time in prison, um, and then you move from this. You're given some food. Now you see in prisoners who have got trusted jobs that they're giving you your food. First first chance of eating, or well, not the first, but first time in Bristol of eating prison food. Diabolical, it's horrendous. I mean, make it makes the stuff in the cookhouse look great. It's really poor. Um, and then you go on to the wing. And I've been on the wing before in Gloucester, but Bristol wing was bigger. It was three floors rather than two. And I'm oh, sorry, four floors rather than two. It's like, this is huge. But again, it's 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 nighttime. They're all locked up. No one's there. So um, yeah, the first night was was okay. You're in prison issue clothes because you're, you're, everything gets taken off of you. You're searched, you're, you're checked thoroughly for anything. Um, you go into the into into your cell, and the guards with was a nice guy. He was he was um, suffering with some healthcare issues. He was like, another one weeing all night. Why do I get these people that are in the, on the toilet all night? Um, problem with his um, uh, with his, with his glands somewhere. <laughs> but either way, by the by, so I went out for exercise the following morning, which was the Friday. So I thought I'm gonna go on the yard and get some fresh air. It was a spring. It was actually a really hot spring in 2012. A little yard. There only four of us went on there. Me. Two guys, different nationalities. I think I was the only guy from the UK on there. Um, and I was walking around the yard and just on my own, not really bothered about other people, just just minding my own business. And this guy came up to me and he said, oh, what are you in for, mate? Just being found guilty of conspiracy. Oh, right, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he's, we're talking about you. He's, he's just the same thing. He's just, he's just on been remanded. So people on remand are very paranoid people because they haven't yet had their case come through so they're always thinking that who's undercover what's going on and within five minutes he peeled away from me spoke to his mate a big black lad then he come back to me my next lap you go round and round in circles around the yard you've got to walk you can't do straight he's got to do a lap come back and he starts his, his, his tone had changed and i understand why he was he was saying well i didn't really do it anyway and he's he was quite defensive and as if to say that he was trying to plead his innocence whereas before he was talking about his case quite openly now he wasn't what the hell is going on here um so a few days passed and realized that people on the wing are just looking at me in a really weird way and it's a big wing we're talking i think gotta be a couple hundred people on there you know maybe maybe more than that no one was talking to me so eventually i moved on to another wing where my co-defendants were and a few days passed and they found out, do you realize what the rumor was on, on G-Wing? So also, no, they thought you we were undercover police because of how I looked. So I had a wedding ring on at the time and, and, and the whole mentality of the people on that, not all of them, but certainly the majority thought I was undercover police because I, how I conducted myself. It's, you don't look like a criminal. You don't come across as you're Mate, I'll, I'll, when you When you hold yourself as a service person, mm. people, they sent something and when, when you're in the paranoia of the drug world and I, yeah. I had this several several times over the years they they see your short back and sides yeah well yeah very short back and sides now it's now it's short fucking everything yeah <laughs> but they, they see that and um they mistake it for oh you know they think oh oh yeah oh oh, oh, oh yeah I, I get it yeah i was told a few people said you you were because of how you carried yourself, no, nobody attacked me because I was like you know, hyper vigilant, and we are, aren't we? We can't help but be hyper vigilant. And I was, I wasn't going to stay in the in in my cell and going out. If someone's got a problem, they've got a problem. Let's just deal with it and deal with it. There, don't want to, but you have to. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when I found out they all thought I was undercover, it, it was more of a case of you just going to get stabbed or cut from behind. 
you know, that's what it would have amounted to. So, but the, the difficult thing was, even though I was on my wing and I had my co-defenders who'd been there on remand for about a year, had vouched for me and said, no, this guy, he is not undercover. Trust me, we know he's undercover. No, he's definitely undercover. They're so ignorant because they're just judging you by how you look. Their perception of someone that's involved in, in that level of criminality looks a certain way, acts a certain way. They're of a certain, maybe a certain nationality or, or skin color. They just couldn't relate to me. They couldn't relate to me that I was actually who I was and that I'd done the, the, the offense that I'd done. So it seemed really odd. But yeah, it was a bit, um, it was a bit worrying because then I'm thinking, well, I've now got to watch my back. I haven't done anything wrong, but I've got to watch my back. And that was a difficult thing about being in, in Bristol on my mind. I was, I was there for five weeks until sentencing. At this point, I didn't know how long I was going to be doing. I just knew that I'd been remanded for that offence. Sentencing came on the 29th of June, um, about five weeks later, where they hit me with the 15. Uh, and my co-defendants got 18 each. And they were the highest. I was the next one down. There was a number of different sentences all the way down through all of us. Uh, and then we were moved from, we call it black and white, which is H HMP, which is, which is the, the public sector prisons. And I'll, I'll explain this in a sec. To a prison called Loudoun Grange, which is in Nottingham run by Serco, so it's a private prison. Now, you've got two kinds of jail. Now, there are four, I think there's something in the region of, let's say, 40 prisons in the UK. I don't know how many there are. There's quite a few. Um, 14 of which, and I think 13 now, because one of them has lost the contract, are privately run. They're, they're, they, they take a tender from the government and they run the, the prison as a business for a private security. So you've got Serco, GFRS, and Sodexo, the French company, who own or run these 14 or 13 prisons so when you go into the private sector it totally changes because you're no longer looking at a prison officer who's been who's who's uh, run working for the government in the black and white they're in g4s uniforms or circa uniforms first name terms they'll call me rich i'll call him dave you know and it's all oh, this class is great and this this the, the prisons are new you know this loud and grange at the time in in 2012 was only 14 years old now prison terms that's brand new you walk in, it's, it's like, I guess say they're not trying to make it sound nice, but it was really nice <laughs> compared to Bristol, where people have been taking a dump on the floor and shitting everywhere. This was really nice. It was single cells. We had digital TV. We had, at one point, Sky TV. We had telephones in our cell. We had to pay for the use of the phones, pay for the calls you would do normally. We had the showers in your cell, everything. And at this point, if, if this is as bad as it gets, then this ain't bad at all. So yet that kind of already you're thinking, well, at least this part is boxed off. I'm comfortable. The food's still crap, but at least I'm comfortable in myself. I've got my own privacy. I've got my phone. I've got my television. And you can work your way out the tier system to a point where you're, um, you've got a three tier system in, in the prison. And it's called the IEP. And if no one's ever heard of this before, You've got, you come into the prison as a standard level, which means you get three, I think about three visits. You're allowed to earn a certain wage, like a certain pay band, and you can have a certain amount of money sent in to you. Plus you can, you know, that's where your prison status is. You, you are at standard. Now, if you demonstrate that you're trustworthy and you're behaving yourself and you're not causing problems, after about 10 weeks, you can be raised to enhanced level, which means you get another visit means you can earn more money, you can build a higher pay band, and you, you, you can earn these privileges. You can then have a, a stereo, you can have an Xbox, a DVD player. So you then start making life as comfortable as you can. You can then get a better job in the prison, so you can earn better wages. You can, you can buy nicer food for yourself. So you talk to or demonstrate that if you can behave, you can have it pretty good. Because with every job in prison comes, comes its perks. You, know, it might, you might get a job in the kitchen, you can actually cook the food yourself rather than it being destroyed by the people cooking it for you so you might be able to to have something like a piece of cheesecake you don't get that for your dessert but to 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 make it fresh and eat it yourself it's just it's the simplest things and what what you learn is to suddenly realize that the most simplest things in life hold a value they 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 become cherished and you relearn what's important in life like your family, like your friends. You learn to live with nothing. So everything, everything means something. You know, and, and that's what I found from it is, is the simplest pleasures in life, which you cannot have in prison, 
like walking through a field. Hate it with a pack on my back, but it's lovely when you just get a chance to do it with, with, with just because you can. And so all of a sudden your mentality changes and that's what you need to do is adjust your mentality. So I spent two and a half years in that prison and, and I engaged with the veteran system. So there are veterans in custody. And I'll probably go on, I'll go on to this now because I think it's the kind of the path that I took. And I was offered the opportunity to sort of like be a, a key player in the veterans at Loudon Grange. But it was difficult because category B and category A prisons, and they're running the tier of security. A is the high security, then it's B, then it's C, then it's D, then you're out. Category A prisons and some of the Bs, there are a lot of extremism going on in these places. And unfortunately, these guys tend to run the wings because they've got that many people behind them, uh, fanatics and extremism that most or a lot of veterans have to stay underground. They can't always declare their service because they become a target. Wearing a poppy can be problematic in some of these prisons because you're then painting a target on your chest. You know, this is really difficult. And, and in the category B, it was hard to declare to be a veteran. The services weren't really there because they weren't really catering for it or they're unable to cater for it. It changed when I went to a category C called HMP Oakwood, which is, my opinion, and of a lot of others, is a brilliant prison. It, it's graded number one in the UK because of the director. And he's a brilliant man. And the staff that work with him are exceptional because of his ethos into the prison is something else. You know, he, he will empower you to follow your dreams as long as his dreams are true and, and you're not going to cause harm so if you've got a genuine idea and it's it's good it's for the it's for the better for yourself or for other people it'll encourage you to follow that and he will facilitate you that and i'll go into that in a sec so i moved to hmp Oakwood, which is in wolverhampton i could have come down to near bristol i could have come down to earl stoke which is in devices which is a good job but it's not private and Oakwood is private, run by G4S. I went there because I had single cells. I had the shower in a cell. I had the phone. I had all the same stuff that I was used to. And that got me through the first two and a half years of my sentence. So why would I change that? Because I could be in devices. I'm still locked up. Or I could be in Wolverhampton. I'm still locked up. And my wife at the time said, look, it's up to you. If you're, you're only seeing us once every couple of weeks, why would you deprive yourself of all these nice things and be in a different prison just for sake of, a, of an hour's visit when if you're in your own cell you can ring us every night you're not standing in a queue on the wing to get to use a public phone and everyone hearing you say how much you love me or how upset you are or how worried you are about the kids you know so that private phone and, and that facilities in HMP could make a, made a massive difference wow and it, it, it's a huge thing honestly it's such a big deal to have those simple things to to have those family ties to speak to people when you want Christmas Day. Can you imagine? Everybody wants to make a phone call Christmas Day to their family. You've got two phones on the wing. You've got 89 people all want to ring up and say Happy Christmas. Can you imagine the pressure that you'd have on these wings without these phones in the cell? You know, it's, it's invaluable. Honestly, it makes such a difference. So I arrived at Oakwood and I was, there was a great man called Ian Rock. He's since passed of cancer several years ago and he was ex-RMP and he was the manager on a wing called Douglas Wing, which is where I went. It was a lifer's wing and long-termers wing. He got me on there within about five weeks of landing in Oakwood. Following month, and this was in January 2015, he gave me a job as a veterans representative and the guys at the time in, in there weren't really proactive they were they were veteran reps but they weren't really doing anything about it they were too busy in life and i thought no this thing good we got guys in here so i started to go around the wings find the veterans check the list that i had if it was valid if it was up to date and just create a new list and start to publicize it through the system now the good thing with these private jails is that in the, in the older prisons if you want to apply for anything it's all done on apps or applications paper they get lost most of the private jobs have got an ATM or electronic kiosk touchscreen. You you input your, it's, it's biometric, so you input your number and you, you scan your fingerprint, it opens up your your login, your details, and you can order your food, you can order your, you can book your visits, you can top up your phone credit, you can do anything on there. So you can also, you also get notices coming through on that, it's for general notices to see. So I put out notices on there through the staff to say, are you a veteran, have you served this, so blah, 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 we'll contact us and we'll come and find you. So. I spent a couple of years building this veteran database, 
sorting out meetings, getting Safa to come in and you know, look at the guys who are due for release, what do they need when they're getting out, and where are they going, have they got somewhere to live, have they got any issues they need to sort of pick up with, and trying to get re reboot the whole veteran support in Oakwood. And over the first year or so, I'd, I'd sort of support that many veterans, I'd, I'd identify, and we spent a lot of time chatting in yourselves, you know, talking about the problems that you've had. These are guys in for all different offences, but the offence kind of gets left at the door a little bit. What, what I was looking at is the difficulty in the transition of what got you in jail, mate? Why did it go so bad? And I noticed so many similarities in what these guys had faced and, and what they'd experienced. And even some of the staff suffered the same problems because we had staff on the meetings. We, we had a network of staff that had served, which were really supportive. And I thought to myself, when you arrive in jail, um, probation will set you a, a sentence plan. And this helps you to address your, your, your offending behaviour. A part of this may include you, one of you behaving and not reoffending, but some of it is actually you might put you on a course. So if you're in for alcohol, you might have to do a substance misuse course, or if you're in for violence, you have to do some sort of anger management, you know, these sort of things. And I thought, there's no courses here really which address veterans for our mentality and our, and our, our, our mindset. Um, and if you put a veteran on an anger management course or a veteran on a mental health course and say, why, why do you keep flying off the handle, mate? And he's not going to talk about his PTSD in front of people which he doesn't know. You've already lost him straight away. And, um, they, and they ain't going to understand it anyway, are they? Not, not no. if it's service-based. No, that's right. If someone's got PTSD from, a, from an accident or, or understandable, but combat-related, and I can't say I've not got combat-related PTSD, but I understand the guys. I understand what they could have gone through. So I look back and I did some research as much as I could. So are there any courses which are written for veterans in prison to help us to address our mentality? No, nothing. Right. So I wrote one. So I sat there, I had access to a laptop through my job as a mentor, and I wrote a course or a program um, based on my journey coming out of the army, uh, of all the different things, of all the different areas I knew I'd gone wrong in. And I wrote a 12 module course, which I then delivered to veterans in custody to start off as a few case studies, RAF, Royal Navy, Army, everyone right across the board, a couple of Marines. Um, did everyone across, and got the case study results back in, presented that to the director, and they said, right, okay, that's really good. We wanted to run it as a pilot in 2017. So I ran a five course uh, program through 2017 as a pilot course, which I did, and that worked out really well. And then I started delivering the course officially in HMP in 2018, prior to release 2019. So while I was inside, I was, as well as developing my own release plans and coming out of prison, I started to deliver this course to veterans in custody about their mentality and 12 modules, I'm going to forget them, but the first one links to our mentality and risk-taking behaviour, which is a big deal for most of us anyway. That's one of the key areas that we suffer with. Um, relationships about how we um, adjust and our relationships change when we come out of the forces because we do change ourselves. You know, we we go through this fundamental change of being someone who's served to to a veteran, not necessarily but a veteran, and, and we go through a lot of changes. And people around us are going to have to absorb those changes. I dealt with trust. My biggest error to me was trusting. I trust any. I trust everyone because I'm used to trusting people or not trust anyone. Um, substance misuse, mental health, being realistic with yourself about these ridiculous dreams that we have about achieving anything which we know we can surrounded by like-minded company as a group of soldiers you can achieve massive things but you take that one person out and try and do it on your own with your civilian counterparts you're going to struggle so it's about setting yourself up to be realistic and understand that you're going to you're going to fall you're going to fail have, have achievable goals um employment debt and money management you know looking after yourself there are so many different things i want to focus on and um, that was where I was when I left. When I left in July 19, the plan was and is to go back into HMP Oakwood and deliver this course under funding to veterans in custody. Unfortunately, there were certain things happened last year around about spring, which, which put a hold on that, which we're going to readdress that as and when things return to normality because there's a lot of lockdowns going on, you know, which, which we have to understand right now. Well, let, let's not go getting political, but but yeah. but because... <sighs> Because we do that in every podcast, but yeah. let's just remember all these people now that could be having your wonderful service, yeah. could be going on to be happy, productive, pro producing mentally well balanced people like like we have become. Yeah, they're all denied that now. Yeah, in case some 
85 year old with an underlying heart condition might get the flu and die you know yeah, it, and it is difficult it's a really bitter pill to swallow but it's it's, it's you know this i'm i'm very verbal about it mate because yeah, we're in a veterans suicide epidemic now. Mm. You know, mental health in this country is just at an all time high. Yeah. Um, just when you think you're getting on top of things like child abuse, spousal abuse, out, you know, substance. Uh, well, we we <coughs> we just kicked all kicked the ass. You know, <coughs> excuse me. We just kicked all that in 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 into touch and. Yeah. It's unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. Um, and why? Well, it goes back to big pharmaceutical again, isn't it? It's to make these so yeah. sociopaths rich. That's all it's about. Um, yeah. They're lucky to some respects that I've, been, I've still got great support from the from the prisons, um, even the military. I mean, I've, I've so so privileged to whilst I was still in, in custody, you get released on a thing called Rotter, which is released on temporary license. I mean, they'll let you out for the day maybe under supervision maybe not and number of occasions i've been i've been into RAF cosford i've delivered a presentation to all the staff there i've been into uh two two signals in stafford delivered there i was the first person to ever go into uh, a police training school in ports head near bristol and talk to them about veterans in custody about project to the course i wrote about the the journey the veterans face and why some of us may offend and since then, even the Somerset has set up a veterans champion network with a support of veterans. So I've been really fortunate that people have bought into what I'm trying to do. And despite what's going on at the minute, that it's still all there waiting to happen. How have how have you been received then, Rich, as a person with your history by these by the veterans community, or et cetera, et cetera? Really well. You get you're always going to get someone who's going to take it for face value and maybe say something slightly derog derogatory but that's something i'm ready for and, and and to be fair i expect and and would wouldn't I'd, I'd be stupid to not accept the fact some people are going to take exception and to my background um you're going to get people who are going to say things but do you know what the vast majority and i'm talking 99 percent and even more than that are really good they're very very welcoming when they look a bit deeper into it first thing they'll see is drug dealer oh scum yeah agreed but look a little bit further and look at what i'm trying to do now and then they also they they, they they do tend to come out and say actually you know what mate fair play thank you for what you're trying to do because i'm not the sort of person that'll sit around and just do nothing you know i, I have to be active i have to keep doing and, I, and i've got i've got more to prove than most i feel like i need to make up for a lot of years which i wasted being greedy looking after myself i think i've got a lot a lot of ground to make up and you're going to get many people more determined than someone's been inside and has turned their life around god excuse us mate That's right. <clears throat> i keep pulling the mic down by the way because there's an overgrown woodpecker hammering at the office next door <laughs> Is that... i might go out my 12 born a minute and yeah just go and iron them out <laughs> well this is um yeah <coughs> Oh, excuse me. <coughs> no, I was going to go off at a tangent, then, but and um, just one question I had. So, did 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 it ever kick off in the prison? And had you adopted any kind of strategy if it did? No. Do you know? What? I was. I can't believe it. I was expecting it to be a rough ride. I was expecting it to always be some kind of scrapping and fighting and. It never was. I mean, th th I think the thing is, if you're you're going in there expecting to be fighting, you're going to be fighting. You're going to be having problems because that's your your approach. If you go in there expecting just to survive and you just assess it as it is, you look back and think, well, the people what the, the only people the reason people end up scrapping is because they're usually up to no good, and it's a territorial thing or it's a money owed or a debt of some kind. Generally speaking, it's down to a debt or an ego. If you don't have any of those, then you're, you're not going to have a problem. I didn't have any, not one incident. I had one guy I put in his place, two guys that I put in their place. Um, but that was that was just, a, you, if you smile a lot, people get used to smiling. When you, when you suddenly don't smile, they know that you're, they know you're serious. And that's usually enough, you know? And there's only two people I ever had to sort of like, say, look, rain it in, mate. 
you're going too far and, and they do it's because people people will push you a little bit maybe they're having issues in their own life that's not my problem no i was lucky i mean i don't think even any of my co-defendants have problems but the nature of our offense with it being a a big deal in the press and the amount of us that were in there the wings that you're on the people you're around the most people who are likely to cause a problem just don't even see you as someone they want to go near you know there is a hierarchy in prison lifers people in for organized crime and armed robberies are generally float at the top somewhere so most of the people who are going to be the so your scallies who are going to be in for the street robberies they're they're the, the more violent individuals that are in there but they don't even come near us they just they, they, they avoid us if anything and it's not out of fear i think it's, i don't think it's even out of respect i think it's just they just think well they're not interested we're on a whole different level you know they're they're in for street crimes and they're that's their thing we're not so no, I was really lucky. No, I, no, I didn't. I witnessed some pretty rough things. Self harm, horrendous. The amount of self harm that you actually get exposed to inside it happens all the time, but most people don't actually see it or witness it or or even have to to to, to manage it themselves. But that's something I learned a lot inside. Was the amount of self harm is is frightening, and the the lengths that some people will go to to do this self harm. And I've seen some, I thought I'd seen blood, but I've seen a lot of blood. Mm. I've seen a lot of blood. Yeah, it's... Well, look at Chopper Reed, one of the world's hardest men. Chop, chopped his own ears off because he can knock it in the, yeah. you know, on, on one particular wing. I witnessed a guy do that, take his own ear off with a, with a, a plastic dinner knife. He's like this, just taking it off because he and that, that was in the block in Loudon Grange. He'd had enough. and he, he just managed to get the top of it off. And I thought, well... Why? Why? I was yeah. working broadly at the time. I can understand now. Now I know more about self harm. Back then, I was just new. I, I, I think, well, but now I've learned a lot more about mental health and coping mechanisms and strategies and, and, and life changing experiences when you're young. I can understand why it comes out now. You know, but back then, it's like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And a lot of people have that same impression, but you need to understand the person. And one of my jobs in cyber was you get things called listeners. And it's a person or a prisoner who is trusted and trained by the Samaritans to carry out the role of a Samaritan on the wings. And you'll be on call 24 hours a day. And what you'll do is there's a, if there's a, a resident who's, who's in crisis, you'd be called as a pair or two of you as listeners to go into this person's cell and sit down with them and, and help them through a difficult time, not to advise, but to listen to what they're saying. And you'll sit there and you'll listen to them and you'll listen to a lot of people who've got major issues. It's taken advantage of people see it as another way to get things from A to B. Some people actually actively become listeners in order to, to find it as a way to get transport items from one part of the prison to another. Because someone will say, yeah, I need a listener. And they'll know that this guy on certain wing is a listener. And they'll hope that he's the one that's going to come to that cell. So it's very clever how the, the, the staff do it because it's on a rotor. Yeah. And it's random. So you won't necessarily get the same listener come through. But that's something else. So I'm trained as a, as a, as a partner, as a Samaritan to help people through bad times. So I understand and I've heard a lot of people say about they've gone back about how they are. And, and it's just it's quite worrying to think that half these people in prison probably shouldn't even be in there. You know, they, they certainly should be somewhere more. The therapy is what's needed, not locking up. Mm. But unfortunately, the, the, the system doesn't know how to cope with someone who's problematic. You know, if, they're, if they're kicking off and they've got issues with psychosis or, or you know, um, paranoia there's something there's a reason for that it may be drug induced but there's the reason is the drug induced because they've got problems from the past as you said chris so they're putting them in prison when really the safest place is to be in a hospital where they can get looked at assessed and, and correctly medicated and treated and that's not what's happening they've been put in prison and given other medication which maybe is enough to keep them quiet but it's not dealing with their demons no yeah it's hard but i never never experienced anything negative personally apart from when my my dad had a stroke and a, and a severe accident that was probably the phone call i was wishing i, I was hoping i was never going to get he didn't die he survived luckily but it was horrific you know it was touch and go for quite a while and i was actually taken out taken out in cuffs to go back down to bristol to visit my dad as, as known as an end of life visit in other words to say goodbye dad i love you you're gonna die he didn't die he survived didn't he? It's tough tough as an old boot but that was difficult that was difficult. But other than that, fairly, fairly straightforward, mate. And your book, Charlie Four Kilo, 
doing yeah. well, mate. Yeah. Do you know what? We, we, it was my plan B. Uh, when, I, when I was on trial, I thought, I hope I get away with this and I'm going to sell off under the sunset and be a really good boy. And if I don't, I'll have to write a book about it because I think I've got enough content to do something. So it kind of remained dormant for quite a while because you can't actually write the book inside because it has to be on pen and paper and I have to redo it again. And things change and things move on. And But the book was always an, was always an idea. And when I was doing these, lucky to do these various talks and presentations to the police and to military bases and, and various other places, they said, oh, you should write a book, Chris. And I thought, I am thinking about it. So I started writing it in when I was being released on on a on a daily basis to, to work in the, the local visiting centre for the prison. I had access to a laptop. I've always got access to a laptop. And I thought, let's start writing now. I've got another year and a half, a year before I'm out. Let's start getting it down now. Didn't really have the name for it. I was going to call it The, the Lost Soldier. But with a lack of um, access to digital media, that, that name had already been taken under a couple of different things like a book and a game and I thought yeah but that was the, the the mindset so I started writing it and then when I came out um last year went very quiet so I had time inside just to um to focus on writing and luckily I found a, a good friend of the family a chap called Chris Knott um did a book called Call Sign Chopper and he he said oh have you have thought about a book yourself and I, I said well I have started writing it but I'm, I, I can't find anyone to to publish yet, I can't find a literary agent. He said, well, I've got a guy. So I spoke to a chap with Robert Culpepper and um, he said, we'll do the whole process for you. We'll, we'll take you from the original manuscript. He said, when are you done? I said, well, I think I'm about 70 odd thousand words in. He said, well, bear in mind, every uh, the average book is looking at about 80 to 85,000 words. Otherwise it's getting a little bit too heavy. I said, oh crap, I'm nearly there then. I thought I'm only, I'm only halfway. So I've had to split this one into, into two parts. So yeah, I, I wrote Ch Charlie. So we, we went for the name Charlie Four Kilo for two reasons: phonetic alphabet. It, it's technically a call sign. I don't know whose, but it's mine now, I guess. And for the obvious fact that it's Charlie and it's four kilos, um, which I thought rang well with the industry where I came from. So it's kind of a nice amalgamation of the the, the military and the and the, the organised crime side. So I finished it last spring, uh, and it's taken a while to get it published and typesetting proofreading all the, the stuff that you go through you know how it works and it finally got released uh december last year so it's only just come out it's just it's just come out and it's you know it, it's ticking over i'm just starting the pr now um i don't know how it's going because we don't know from don't quite know yet from the production how many copies have been sold i don't know i've broken any records yet but it is early days and it's a slow burner but it's i've got so much content i can't do it in one book i've got to do four my, um, I think we can dispense with the uh, microphone intrusion. Is the woodpecker been... the, the woodpecker has stopped. <laughs> the shotgun is safely in its cabinet. No, folks, I haven't got a shotgun. Um, yeah, my best advice to you, mate, if you want a career in this game, yeah, well, that game, the writing game, is get you get your second book done, then you get third, fourth, fifth, until you got six or seven. They yeah. don't bounce off each other. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see a lot of first-time authors do is just try to kick the house, kick yeah. the ass out of promoting one book. Yeah. Or one book to one person, they're going to talk to maybe one other person about it. When you've got yeah. 10 books to 10 people, talking to 10 yeah. other people, recommending yeah. to their, posting to social media, then suddenly you, you, you actually start to make a really decent well, you know, yeah. can make a really decent return. And with the audio book scene now, there's another. Yeah, I've got to start the audio book in the spring. I'm going to do it myself. I've just got to learn to speak properly first, so I'm going to have a go at that. Um, no, you got the fine voice for it. You, you, yours would be good done yourself, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. so, so I'm, I'm happy with it. I, it's just, I mean, it starts at part two, which is a, a section of my life, which is absolute pandemonium. I thought, well, I started part two because it literally takes a segment of six months of my life, which involves you know, a few police arrests and a few things going on in my life. And it just, it sees my, it really brings through the stress of, as, as we spoke about the, the world that I was involved in. And it shines a light on the difficulties faced by a veteran. And it is from a veteran's perspective as well, not just someone involved, but someone who's served in the forces. And I try to make it relatable. And it takes to a point where, you know, where 
I leave on a cliffhanger because of the other things that's happening. So I move over to um, start doing things overseas, but it's all about paying a debt off basically. What do you do? What do you do, Rich, when you're not writing? Well, at the minute, I've, I've, I'm, you know, coming out of prison at the age of, well, no, I'm 51 now. I was like just approaching 49. You're not that employable. So I was was working with, um, this is all stuff which is still happening, but we're, we're doing it differently at the minute. I, I, I assist SAFA with training sessions with their staff that go into prisons. Um, I'll give them a talk about what to expect, the sort of things a veteran will be suffering with. So I kind of give them a bit of a, highlight on the areas of concern which they're going to look at just give them a, you know, to, so they can go in over their eyes wide open at what what to expect what to see so I do a training session with Safa I do I'm um, setting some of that with RF cost for it to go in and do talks with their recruits in the training camp about substance misuse and there's something I'm looking at with different bases again it hasn't quite gone off yet um, I've engaged with the MCTC to look at going down and speaking to guys being um, discharged with uh, substance issues against them and looking at delivering project TLS to them as a course as a part of their, their transition out of, um, out of the MCTC. I'm trying to engage with them. Again, that was at the back end of 2019. Uh, so there's loads of done. And, and you know, at the minute, I'm working with a, a, some good friends, a company called We Like To Move It. They give me a job. And this is totally foreign for me. I'm working in removals. I am literally, keeps me fit, keeps me healthy couple of days a week just to get enough money to survive on but enough to keep my as i got not project here this is a non-profit organization where i work with these guys in removals they donate me furniture through people who are say downsizing in the house allows me to run my furniture bank for veterans who are moving into house i haven't got anything so i've now got a load of stuff for donation to guys who are and girls who are moving in somewhere and need, they might need a, a unit or a wardrobe or a bed so I've got that. I've got a food bank going with Greg's Foundation where we collect unsold food on the night and deliver that to veterans who need it. So there's plenty of things that I'm doing, keeping me busy. Uh, I'm just waiting for the, the, the course. I've recently had a chat with a, a large private healthcare company who want me to go back into the prison, deliver my course across the Midlands. We're just looking at that this, hopefully this month. If we get the green knot on that, that'll be, that'll be life-changing. It means I can deliver that course to all the veterans in the Midlands who are inside, which would be fantastic. So there's plenty I'm, I'm doing and, and writing at the minute is probably the, on, the, on the side. I just want to sort of give it a few months, get the audio book done, and I'll start part two back in the summer, I think, and just dive into that. But a lot of it is really hanging in the balance, depending on what goes on with this healthcare company. If I get a thumb, thumbs up on that, I will know my routine then. I'll know what time I've got aside, what I'm working. Um, if I don't get a thumbs up on that for now, I'll just have to wait until things sort of settle down this year and see where it goes. So at the minute, I'm doing everything. I'm a dad. I've got two sons. Well, they're growing up, but I spend a lot of time with kids. You know, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty busy. Pretty busy. Good man. Rich, listen, massive thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm a yeah, very you. lucky man, mate, that I get to just sit and chat to wonderful people with amazing stories that are doing so much for our veterans family. And it's not just that, is it? This is this is an education for all people that, yeah. you know, you didn't hear this stuff when I was a young person. No one was rushing out to help me when I was, you know, living in utter squalor and, not far from death most of the time. Um, yes. so, so thank you ever so much. I'm going to put your links below the video. Okay, thank you. So anyone listening, this Rich is your man. If you need some, some consultancy advice, yeah. you know, you're in a situation where you you need some answers, they, they, there you go, you know. Um, yeah. And obviously we'll put the link for your book as well. Thank you, Chris. And um, just just stay on the line, Rich. So massive thank you to you, mate. I really, really appreciate it. Massive love, as always, to all of our subscribers. Um, you guys are really just turning into an awesome... Well, you probably already were an awesome bunch of people. <laughs> but the kind comments that are flooding in now and the support we get for telling, you know, this part of life that has always been hidden by mainstream media um it's you know it's really making this a very worthwhile job if i could just ask you guys to like and subscribe and click the little bell 
because they get a lot of messages from people. Chris, I didn't get, you know, I didn't know you did a podcast with so-and-so. If you click the bell, you will. That's it. I'm out of here. Thank you.